Hi there, my name is Aaron Short. Welcome to my YouTube channel again. This is great. Today is August the 23rd and Maury is on vacation. That means I have the keys to his store and we can do anything we want. No, just kidding. That's not what's going to happen today. Take, I take that back. Today I'm joined with Spoon Phillips because I know everyone here in this community loves Spoon Phillips. He got, he's got so much knowledge and information about Martin guitars and, and guitars in general. It's always a pleasure to have him here. And feel free to ask your question. I'm going to ask you today to put a cue in front of a question because I know you'll be chatting with each other. So just put a cue and we know that's a question that we'll address. We will address them in order. And if I get any super chats, I will bring those to the front and we'll spend a bit more time on them. Okay. Um, also today, I'm going to post Spoon's link throughout the chat as we go as well. So you can go and check out his website, subscribe to his YouTube channel. And if you like what he does, you can purchase his album from his website as well, which is excellent as we know, because Roweth occasionally sends us a cover of him playing a Spoon Phillips song. And I always encourage you, if you're watching, to send some pictures of yourself playing your Martin guitar. Play the guitar, send us a picture of your guitar, send us a video of you unboxing your guitar, or send a picture of you drinking from your Soundhole Sniffer TM mug. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. Oh, this is great. I'm so glad everyone's here. It's, it's so much better when we have uh, people in the chat, of course. Otherwise, it's just me and Spoon hanging out. So without further ado, Let's bring on the one and only Spoon Phillips. Hi, buddy. Hey. Hello, <laughs> how are you? I'm doing well. Let me bring myself on here as well so you can see me. There we go. I'm doing well. Um, we right. were supposed to get really bad weather, and I saw that Brooklyn had bad weather, but I, I think I missed most of that. Did you see any, any of that rain this weekend? Uh, yes, I did. We had a lot of uh, significant like tropical downpours, but not... Not any of the serious stuff people were afraid we were going to get. So yeah, I know some people did, so I'm thinking of them. But uh, yeah, luckily uh, we weren't affected. I, I saw a place down in Bay Ridge that looked really flooded the other day. But. Oh my, yeah, I'm sure around the coast. Yeah. I'm up on a ridge in Park Slope, up by Prospect Park, so uh, so I'm away from that. I I did see that on uh, Saturday night or Sunday morning, there was an hour that got the most rain New York City's ever gotten in, in a single hour. So it was yep. definitely a lot of rain. Yeah, I saw that. And they ended the concert early. They did a free concert in Central Park. They had to finish it early because the rain was approaching. Ah, uh, I saw yeah. people mentioning that coming back from a concert. And I had no idea what they were referring to, but now yep. I know. Yeah. So before we begin, we've got some things we want to talk about. And first of all, you were telling me about something called International Play Music on the Porch Day. So can you tell us what that is, please? Yes, thank you. I wanted to make a plug for this. Play Music on Your Porch Day has been around for several years. I took part in it last year for the first time. And you can check them out on their Facebook page or their YouTube page or their Instagram page. It's called Play Music on the Porch Day, uh, the full name international, because there are people all around the world. There was these really talented guys from Mozambique, people in Indonesia, Norway, all over the United States. Uh, you can make a pre-recorded video and just put it on there, uh, upload it to their YouTube page or Facebook page. You can uh, do your, put it on your own page and put the tag for uh, Play Music on the Porch Day. Um, there's people that are sitting on their porch with their friends and continually upload individual videos that they recorded right then and there. Uh, no porch is necessary. You can be in your living room, on your on the back patio, uh, out in a park, and uh, some really cool stuff. Everything from little kids up to very accomplished uh, choral groups of music of all types. And it's this Saturday, August 28th. It's always the last Saturday of August. I highly recommend you guys take a look, take part, watch music all day long. And uh, in and even after the day, they'll continue to have the videos up online. But totally worth checking out. Sounds good. I don't have a porch, though. Can I still participate? Absolutely. They say okay. no porch is necessary, so you can just do it from your apartment or your rooftop or whatever you want to do. Okay, sounds good. Hopefully my neighbors won't mind. Um, <laughs> hey, before I begin, I've just got this new feature on here. I can post a poll in the chat for everyone that's watching. We can ask them a question, and if they answer it, it will be anonymous. I think this is a really cool way to find out what people really think 
about a certain topic to do with with the guitars. So is there something you'd like the chat to answer for you, some research that we can do today via an anonymous poll? Yes. Well, there's more than one, but that, this is the one I'll start with, and maybe uh, the okay. next time I'm on, I'll, I'll have uh, some even more exciting ones. People <laughs> are familiar with the dreadnought size guitar. It's the most popular acoustic guitar design in the world. I would like to know if people associate that guitar with a particular uh, kind of playing. Do you think the dreadnought is best for A, strumming, B, flat picking, C, finger style, or D, all of the above? Ah, I'm not doing that anymore because last week I said you prefer mahogany, rosewood, or both, and everyone just said you both. both. Yeah, so give, it, give it that to me reason. again. All so right. strumming. All right. So we'll just say, uh, do you think the dreadnought is p better at strumming, flat picking, or finger picking? Strumming, flat picking, or finger picking. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's good. Asking people to nail it, nail it down. Let's see what they have to say, ultimately. Do you associate the dreadnought body shape as best for strumming, flat picking, or finger picking? Okay. Excuse my grammar. I'm just going to post it anyway. Ask the community. There we go. So answer that for us. It's completely anonymous. So just let us know uh, what your thoughts are. It's just some extra research for us. Okay, we're going to get started soon. We've already had loads of questions, all right? And I, I remember the ones we did before, we had loads of questions. We will go as long as we can. Obviously, we can't be here all night long. So I'm going to invite people, if they, if you have a question you really want answered in detail and you want to make sure it's answered, I'm going to invite you to super chat it. And what that does is it highlights it for me and I'll put that to the top of the list, okay? Otherwise, I'm put a queue in front of your question and I'm just going to go through them in order and we'll just try and fit in as many as we possibly can. So Spoon Phillips, are you ready? Yes, I just now turned on the chat, so I'll probably see even less than you will, so I'll have to rely on you to fill me in. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. Turn, I'm, let I'm me turn on a light. I'm I just want to see if this makes me... I realize uh, I look a little dark on your screen, so let me see if this if this is be better or worse. That's not bad. No, That's I'll fine. Stick, stick with that. Okay. I, I am going to um, moderate the chat. I'm going to let you answer the questions. If anyone's got questions about guitar pickups or things that I talk about on my channel, then you can ask me. But let's give Spoon the, the platform today. So I'm just going to be moderating, checking the chat, and posting the questions to you, Spoon. If you've got something you want to put to me, you can. But let's, let's get started with the first one as a warm-up, and let's see uh, how we go. So I've got to go all the way to the top here. And... Hi to Jasper, good to see you. Oh, you've gone rather large. Let me just fix that. <laughs> he sent a super chat. Thank you. Oh, well, if I get a super chat, I'm going to do this one. Sorry, Spoon. Okay, I appreciate right. it. So, can you explain uh, super chat quickly? So they can pay, if they if they pay donate to my channel. The the chat comes up with a highlighted graphic, so I see it on the screen. Ah, right. So cool. and and in return for that, I'll put it to the front of the queue. I think that's fair. But Spoon, I'm also going to post a link to your um, directly to your website where people can support you and buy your album as well. And I'm going to put that in the chat and pin it in there so people can click on that. Please do click on that and subscribe to his channel if you like what we're doing. And also check out his album, Lost and Haunted Ways. They can purchase it there as well, right? That's correct. Okay. I just I'll got make a sure. new batch. I sold out and I had to order more. So. Oh, great. That's that good news. Great. So let's, let's help him sell it even more. All right. So Jasper, for that, I will give you your first question, of course. Um, da, 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 okay. He says, since you're, and there's the, uh, then I'm going to jump forward to the ones with the queue. So if you didn't put a queue, then put a queue in front of your question. I'm going to jump down to those. But he said after his super chat, since you are slowly liking to start Jason Isbell songs, why not do a review on his custom Martin D18 one day? Ridiculous guitar, and it comes without the pick guard for even more volume. So Spoon, before I give that to you, I did see that guitar at a NAMM show. And I played Jasper's Request on my stream yesterday. That's why I learned that song for him, because he, he asked me to play it. And I really like I really like Jason Isbell. I've also seen him live at one of the summer NAMM shows at a Gibson party. He's really, really great. And I'm going to listen to his albums now. But do you have any information on that model? Because I remember when they released it. I think it's discontinued now, right? Yeah, they were limited. Most, most of the signature models for the bigger artists are limited editions. And they only make a particular number of them, 50 or 100, you know, something like that. It was uh, Jason, uh, throughout most of Martin's history, they never gave guitars to artists. 
and until I mean, literally ever. And um, and they had plenty of big shots try to wheedle guitars out of them as an endorsement deal, and they never did that. When up until after Fred was Fred Barton was in charge of the company, and and then they approached Eric Clapton and they started the signature model thing. When they do a signature model, you get one guitar and proceeds from the profits of that signature edition go to the charity of your choice. And you're also in front of the line if you want to buy more guitars. Then they started what they called their ambassador program. And Jason Isbell was one of the Martin ambassadors. And they gave him a D18 authentic 1939 uh, to use when he was appearing uh, as a Martin ambassador. Uh, and he liked it so much that when they approached him about doing a signature model, he based his signature model on the D18 authentic. But he wanted something that was even more austere in terms of the looks. He wanted uh, something where all the money went into the quality of the woods and the construction. So it's uh, it's similar to the D18 Authentic, other than it has the Jason Isabel uh, emblem that is a combination of his wife and his uh, personal icons uh, to celebrate the birth of their son. And... Um, and off the top of my head, I don't remember about the neck and the bracing, if it's exactly the same as you get with the D18 Authentic. I don't think it is, but I would really have to remind myself. I have, there's a review on my website, onemans.com. There's, uh, there's a review of that model from when it first came out, and I played the prototype at the factory. Oh, you did? I've, yeah. I've, just, I've just pinned that website to the chat so everyone can click on that. Now, what do you think about the pick guard? I've heard companies like Cole Clark say that when you don't have a pick guard on the pick guard on the guitar, you do get more volume and sustain. Do you have you ever experimented with that? I think it's probably true. I but to the degree, I mean, I've had I've had uh, guitars that didn't have pick guards. The Lawrence Juber models don't have pick guards because he's plays finger style all the time and doesn't need a pick guard, you know. But it's like other people. There are teacher guitar teachers that that don't allow their students to ever put their pinky on the fretboard for the same reason. I mean, on the top while they're f playing finger style. Obviously there's plenty of people who put one or two fingers on there. There's people that, you know, palm mute the top when they're playing bluegrass stuff. And, you know, so you're talking about minutia of, of difference. And so obviously if somebody wants all over the possible volume and, and uh, sensitivity of the top, they could possibly muster then no pick guard and a skinny bridge instead of a belly bridge and never touching the, the fretboard is, I mean, never touching the soundboard is definitely going to have some impact. But how much is negligible as far as I'm concerned? That, that's for another video on, on my channel. Take, get the hairdryer, remove the pick card and do an com AB comparison. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, I'm sure it makes a difference too. But I like, I like having the pick guard because otherwise you do tend to wear through the tops rather quickly. Well, I do yes. the way I play. All right. So I, I did see before you get to the cues, I saw one yeah. other question at the top. I don't remember if it was Kuki. It might have been Kuki. Uh, somebody, in it, or it might have been Roeth. It was uh, Roeth. It was uh, a question of did Martin ever make a deep body triple O or OM? And uh, I'll just answer that right now. The answer is yes. They made the deep body OM uh, thirty. Uh, it's called the OM thirty deep body. And it's the uh, signature model of Pat Donahue, who is uh, the uh, a Whitfield. Uh, he's the only person to win. Uh, is it Whitfield? Whitmark? Whitfield uh, guitar championships in flat picking and finger style. And that was his signature model. It also had a, a slotted headstock. And my custom uh, OM42 with the slotted headstock has the was based on that model and also has a deep body. I don't think they did any deep body double O's, but I mean triple O's, but they did make deep body double 14 foot double O models, models as well out there. I just want to explain to everyone that I did just jump through loads of questions because I, I hadn't explained at that point. We had we had like people here 10 minutes before we even started. So I hadn't explained at that point to type a Q before you type a question. I need people to put a Q in the, in the chat. Otherwise, I'm, I can't read ev what everyone's saying to each other and the questions. So I invite you just to type your question again with the Q there. And then we'll, we'll do it like I think that's the best way to do it. So I'm jumping right down to Philip Watson. So but please, please just type your question again. Just put a Q in front. So Philip Watson says the following. Can you explain 
Oh, now you explain what you want to see. I've already asked two questions. Okay, sorry, Philip. <laughs> okay, fine. Just type it again. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> this is a new thing for me, so it'll take a while to get used to it. Okay, Skip Russell. Are all Martin saddles the same shape? You mean like right now? Are they all? And I don't know what it means by this same shape. The vintage mo uh, models in the Authentic series are long saddles that are uh, embedded and glued in, and are much longer than the what they call the modern short saddle. The faux long saddle that was used in the late vintage series, and and I don't remember if they were used in the retros. They probably were. Those were not true long saddles the little wings were cosmetic they didn't embed all the way in i'm not sure if that's what you're referring to are you referring to are they all compensated i believe all the modern Mar i think every martin made today as a flat top steel string guitar has a compensated saddle uh, which means they shift where they shape where the strings come over uh, the saddle they pull back the b string and maybe the east little e string comes back the high e string comes back a little bit to, uh, because when you depress those strings on the fretboard, uh, the intonation goes off a little bit on old traditional vintage guitars. So they pull back the B string and I'm not sure of the other strings in the exact positions of them, but the B string is visibly noticeably that the string break comes over behind the other ones to uh, adjust for that odd intonation phenomenon. Yeah, I really like that with Martin guitars, you can just order some spare saddles and just sand them down yourself. And then if yeah, they're does... pre-compensated. Pre yeah, yeah they're exactly right. Yeah, they're pre-compensated. So I, that's something I learned later on because I always had my Luthier do my setups and I realized I could order a bunch of saddles from, say, Maury. And then when they arrive, they're, they're good to go. All I've got to do is level them off with sandpaper, make sure they're level, of course, and I can play around with the action or the, the height of the saddle, I should say, myself. So, uh, yeah. That's, that's, that's a really cool thing. So all the standard series use the same one, but some, some of the guitars do use the long saddle, right? Especially the, the, the kind of vintage style guitars. Yeah, the Authentic series definitely has the real uh, long saddles and they're probably compensated. They would not have been compensated in the 1930s, but I bet you, I'm pretty sure they're compensated today, the Authentic series. Do you have any preference? Like if you were ordering a custom today, would you go for a standard saddle length or a extra long? And would you have it? I go in? for the, I've uh, I've always gone for the standard saddles. Um, I had an OM twenty eight V, uh, VR, and it was um, the but somebody had taken the saddle down so far that you couldn't play it above the fifth fret. So I immediately, and the guy I took it to immediately had to blow it out because it was glued in. You just have to destroy it. And he made me another one that's it was a was a uh, drop in. It wasn't glued in. Uh, the whole point of the short saddles that allows you to use uh, the modern under saddle uh, mm. pickups, you know, the, yes. the film pickups, the, the crystal pickups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just never, I never owned a long saddle, Martin. I just wonder, again, this is all like tone stuff, isn't it? If you've got a bigger saddle, you get more transfer of the, of the That's tone. That's correct. You get more transfer of energy. It spreads it out over the bridge, and that goes to the bridge plate and spreads out. You know, Again, it's negligible. Definitely, there is a difference, but there's so many little things that make a difference between uh, one guitar and the other that, um, that most people are willing to put up with the short saddle convenience over what little uh, total benefit it might provide. You know, we talk about all these things that make a difference to tone. I, I just want to show you something. One of our regulars here in the chat um, showed me this years ago. Let me just grab the guitar. I would talk about how all these things affect tone. Of course they do. But he did the thing, and I can't really demo it because I've got a noise gate on my, on my microphone. But if you, if you rest your arm on the top of the guitar, like you were saying, and then strum a chord, and then make sure your arm is completely off it and strum a chord, the difference is so great because you're deadening the top that something like that, the way you hold the guitar, could potentially make a lot more difference than the difference between a short saddle and a long saddle, right? So you've got to bear these things yes, in mind I mean, when you're playing. Yes, those, those kind of things. LJ, uh, Lawrence Juver used to, when he did clinics and stuff, one of the things he would point out was, I know I'm not holding the guitar against my body. He's mm. actually leaning it back so as much mm. of the back as possible is not... Uh, and, and he's the guy that, that really popularized the 
the acoustic whammy bar where he actually and I do this and and but he's the person that really that you know I saw him I was like I do that but he really does it where this whole part of your arm you can use that dynamically when you're sustaining stuff to actually create a a uh, an a acoustic whammy bar and it really actually works yeah so if you're watching if your guitar's next to you grab your guitar keep your arm completely off it strum an open chord then rest your arm on it strum the open chord and then take your arm up and down off it and you get kind of a whammy bar Hendrix effect on your acoustic. There you go. There's a, there's a, there's a nice tip for the day. <laughs> All right. So Jim is here. Hi, Jim. How you doing? Good to see you. It says, hello, everybody from a steamy but dry Vermont. I would last, like to ask Spoon about a 1989, interesting, um, 016 NY. And the NY stands for New York. I have my eyes on it. I'm concerned with the one and seven eight inch um, neck, and are there any other issues? And please, Spoon, tell me what this New York model is all about. I've never heard of this before. Okay, in the 1950s, they were, uh, Martin was getting some custom orders for uh, people asking them to build them a Martin like an 1800s Martin. And um, they decided, uh, Fred Martin decided to call them the New York, uh, when they came out with the, the 016 NY and the 0021 NY, this is 1961 or 60, I think. And, um, and they actually did make a, I think they made a, a double O and my, maybe one triple O and uh, 16 New Yorker. They stood for New Yorker because in those days, New York, uh, Martins had a sticker inside that said New York, New York, because that's where their sole distributor was. Zobich and Sons were their only distributor. They, and so people re referred to New Yorkers that were built with nylon strings and a slotted headstock and a wide neck and a 12 fret body as New Yorker models. So these guitars were aimed at the folk music scene and they were designed to be usable with nylon strings or, uh, or steel strings, very light gauge steel strings. And that's where the popularity of the silk and steel strings started coming out as well, which are very light gauge uh, steel strings that have silk wound into that, the wound strings. And um, so that's what they were called. And they're lighter than normal Martins even for the day. They, most people say they don't work as well with nylon strings as people would have liked. Certainly not like a classical guitar. And you get a, I think you get a different saddle. You actually get a replacement saddle. And the Ian Anderson 028 a signature model was made in the same way. It came with a nylon string saddle, so you could play it with nylon strings or uh, steel strings. So the New Yorker model lasted for a few years. The 1989s, and I'm not sure how many they made right around there, they brought them back for a short period of time. But they're, uh, the original ones are from the early 60s. They're really nice. They're, they're lovely little guitars. You might, if you've never played a one and seven eighth, eighth inch neck on a 12 fret Martin, uh, you might be surprised how easy they are to play. Uh, certainly the old timers from the 20s uh, and 30s um, are surprisingly easy to play. They have uh, congeniously carved necks. I think the modern ones that you get in later years are harder to play because they, they tend to have thicker necks. And uh, I've never, I don't remember playing one from 89, so I can't comment on the neck shape per se, but, um, but they're lovely little guitars. So I'm not sure what issue there is other than uh, the, the wide neck and the wide string spacing. They're, it's not as wide as a classical guitar, which is a full two inches, but it's close. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess the good question is what other things to look for when you're buying? I mean, we've, but so everyone knows we've been talking for a while about doing some vintage Martin um, videos together. I, I really want to do that. I'm trying to get the mics and everything together to do that. And we'll try and do that on location here in New York. But if you're shopping for a vintage Martin, and we'll, we'll cover this in those videos, but just quickly, like what, I mean, I guess like neck resets and fret wear and are there any yeah, things, so big yeah, no-nos you should look for with these? Any, any, uh, any dovetail neck Martin is going to need a neck set eventually. So it's a matter of how long is it going to be? Has it already had one? Um, how are you content playing with the action as high as it is in the upper frets? A lot of people don't play in the upper frets and then even, they don't even think about it. Um, the other thing is the necks can warp too. So, so you're, you know, you're supposed to look down the neck and see if it looks parallel compared to the saddle and all that. 
Um, is there a bulge? Uh, sometimes you get that belly bulge behind the saddle. Uh, you see that on much older Martins. That's one of the reasons modern day, when I say modern day Martins, I think of from the 1950s onward, um, are built a little heavier than the pre-war Martins, uh, exactly for that reason, are braced a little heavier and the, the tops or the soundboards are a little thicker to kind of prevent that kind of stuff. Um, Cracks are not a big deal. Uh, they are to people who've never experienced cracks, but mm. lots of vintage guitars have repaired cracks in them. That's not a, that's not necessarily a sign unless you're a collector looking for a pristine museum edition. It's often not really a concern. So to me, it's that it is. Does it need a neck reset? How long would it need a neck reset? Neck resets have way gone up in price these days. They're probably average in America, $750. Wow. So you can certainly get people who do them for less than that, but you want to make sure you get somebody who actually knows what they're doing. And uh, maybe we should save the details of what does the neck reset really mean, but they basically have to steam the neck off and reshape the, both the V and the, and the dovetail end that fits in the V to, to uh, realign them. That's why, when Bob Taylor came out with the first acoustic guitars with an electric guitar neck, that's why people like Leo Kotke played them because he could reset his own neck with mm -hmm. a screwdriver in the dressing room yeah. in 20 minutes if he needed to. And you can't do that with traditional dovetail neck joints, that's for sure. And you can add shims, but actually the SC13E is like that, isn't it? You can yeah. adjust. Yeah, the later, later Taylors, they came out with the, sh I don't know if they invented the shim idea, but they moved to the shim idea. And uh, yeah, you can put shims in to do that. Do you think that Martin might eventually move to that kind of method to save neck resets? I, I don't think, I think they, this, this new neck uh, joint that they're using for the SC13E, we're, that's certainly not the last we're going to see of that. Uh, that's kind of what the m and uh, the Martin's ten, tennis neck joint that was invented by Michael Gurian and uh, adapted by Martin, uh, that uh, was meant to be easier to adjust and um, and all that, but um, you get a totally you get a you get a different sound from a bolt on neck than you get from a dovetail neck. Hmm. Uh, all you have to do is play, play, uh, and not that that's. I mean, I mean there are plenty of uh, really great bolt on neck guitars. Jim Olson, uh, Goodall, um, Huston Dalton, Collins. Uh, Collins kind of has a dovetail and bolts, but that's kind of a hybrid. And uh, as opposed to something like Santa Cruz, which you just get a thicker throw to your voice. So I'm not expecting to see a D45 made with a shim neck uh, in this century. <laughs> you know, that, way. I've, this, this is a, <laughs> that is a terrible thing to admit, but I've never owned a guitar long enough to need a neck reset on it. So how long does it usually take if you buy a guitar new today? What, what are we looking at? Um, hopefully, and until recently, unfortunately, the way the world economy works, uh, that used to be covered as a lifetime warranty, and Martin oh, wow. would have to do <laughs> neck sets, reset for people who bought their guitar in 1949. Wow! And and every five to ten years, or however long it took, they had to do it. That's it's not it's no longer covered anymore unless unless it's I forget maybe it's five years or something like that, and then mm. they don't cover the the the. Uh, and that's a recent development in the modern corporate era that a lot of people are not happy with. Uh, I've never had a guitar that I had to get a neck reset. I've got, I guess, the oldest guitar I have now have is uh, from the uh, early 90s. And um, and it could probably use one. The, the action's getting high up around the 12th fret and in the cutaway. But mm. I like high action. It's not something I'm actually concerned about. So... So you need to look at the saddle, right? Make sure you've got plenty of height on the saddle so you can still lower that. Otherwise, that means you might need a exactly. neck reset. Exactly. That's, that's how people avoid neck resets is they yeah. keep lowering the saddle. And this saddle, I traded for this guitar. I traded a MC28 for a triple OC16. And, um, and uh, my guitar, the saddle, can't go down any lower. So it is what it is. And so maybe someday I'll have a neck reset put on it, but I don't really feel like it needs mm. it. So... I want to give a quick shout out to, I'm, I'm guessing you know this person, Lisa Faith Phillips, just that sent a lovely tweet out on Twitter saying, join us for an informative talk about Martin Guitar with Aaron Short Music and posted a link to the video. I really appreciate that. If you can, if you can um, retweet or put on Facebook the link to this show, it really helps us out. That's great. 
Okay, next that question. Be, that, that would be my big sister. <laughs> oh, there we go. Thank you, big sister. Looking out for her brother. <laughs> All right. Mark Davis says, and this, this is interesting to me as well. I've heard about the M36. It was originally an arch top, which became a flat top, which is now sold. I've heard this story. This is a New York I, connection, I would right? I would like to uh, put that on the back burner until we get to the question mm. you told me you wanted to ask me because they're related. So well, actually, I'm not. Wait? I'm not going to. I had no idea we'd have this many people, this many chats. So okay. I'm going right. to. I'm going to. Okay. I'm going to scratch my question. We didn't even do right, our well, I can, recap. I Let's can, just do this I'll, one. Okay. I'll do this one, which ties into something Aaron had asked me about. So, in the 1930s, Martin made arch top guitars to appeal to jazz musicians, and they made them in size C which was identical back and sides to a triple O, but it had an arch top guitar, uh, arch top. It wasn't carved like a violin, like they did at Gibson or that D'Angelico and the Italian guitar makers are doing. It was arched because of the extremity of the radius of the bracing. And, um, and then they made the next larger size, the F size. And that was the widest body that Martin had ever made. It still had the, the feminine waist shape, but it was a size bigger. And then, and then they discontinued them. They never really caught on. Um, and then in the early 1960s, um, um, a guy named Mark Silver, who had a show uh, store called Fretted Instruments in Greenwich Village, bought a used F9 with a destroyed arch top and had his repair guy uh, re-top it as a flat top, X-brace flat top. And it was extremely successful. He showed it to his good friend Matt Umanoff, who had a store in the same uh, neighborhood, and he got an F9, and he uh, made a flat top out of it, and he then sold it to his ex-roommate, David Bromberg. And David Bromberg being one of the uh, early influencers of what we would now today call Americana music. And it became his fa favorite guitar. Um, Arlo Guthrie played it. He went out, and I think went to Mark Lumberg and Berkeley and had him convert an F9. And uh, Bromberg took his guitar to the Martin factory and convinced um, Martin that maybe they should think about offering it as a model. And so they went to their molds and they got the F size mold that they still had, the old wooden mold, and they made the M38. And that was the first M model and then the M35 came out right after that. And after like one batch of that or so, they changed the name to M36 because it uh, didn't have the exact uh, same specs as the M30, uh, M30, the 30, style 35. But I'm trying to remember right now what makes it different. But, um, oh, it had a uh, Rosewood Bridge. And, um, and that's where the M came from. And M, I always say, stood for Grand Auditorium. They later renamed it the Quadruple O before naming it back to the M. And you'll still see Quadruple O on the official spec sheets. And then when Chris Martin was really getting involved in the business for the first time on the executive level, he uh, came up with the idea of taking that same silhouette used for the M uh, and by the way, they say the M really stood for M as in Martin because they had size C, size F, and this was size M. So they're using the CFM sort of following that history. So Chris Martin said, why don't we take the M and give it a dreadnought de side depth? And it had had the same side depth as the double O and triple O and old O M. They made it, uh, they made the same silhouette with the dreadnought size, and that's the first jumbo, and that's where the jumbo size came from. So from the front, a jumbo and an M or quadruple, quadruple look exactly the same. What are your thoughts on the M guitars? I've played a couple, and I don't know how I feel about them, sound-wise. Well, first of all, the, the great innovation that Matt came up with, Humanoff, was he gave it a long-scale neck. The Fs, uh, arch tops were short-scale necks. Mm -hmm. And um, so he gave it a long-scale neck and put on Fancy Pearl for Bromberg. They are, and uh, Bromberg was the first person to say this a zillion years ago, it's louder, it gives you volume, but it keeps the string-to-string -string balance of the triple O. So it doesn't have that bass-heavy uh, uh, 
woof that you get from the dreadnought. So it's a bigger voice, but it's um, but the bass is pulled back in line. So it sounds more like a triple O. I think it's gathered and punchy like a triple O rather than the wider sound you get from an OM and to my ear. But people really liked it for the balance back then. They liked it for the volume because they're still playing through SM57 microphones, you know, in Woodstock or whatever. And, and, and so they wanted that. They wanted something that's more comfortable in the lap. That's the other the reason Bromberg likes to play M's. And, uh, and they wanted the bigger voice without having that uh, overbalanced dreadnought size. And the M, that's the M36 is the only uh, M currently in production. It's got a three-piece back like the uh, the Style 35, and uh, and I and I'm trying to remember they they were pretty picky about this. It's Style 35, but it's one more because of something they considered to be fancier. I can't remember what it was. Um, other than the fact it it was I think might have been the very first model to have aging toner on it and uh, to look like an older Martin. So long before Vigi series, the Elms had a, uh, had an, a toner top on them. And it's got a Rosewood bridge, which is unusual. Mm. Uh, the M38 had a, a have a uh, ebony bridge and have a pearl rosette in the sound hole. You know what it is? I'm not a big fan of those tuners or the binding on the neck. But what I would like is a custom M36 with a, with a colorway and different tuners and no binding. Well, cool. the original the original MCs had the uh, extra deep cutaway and a 22 fret mm. neck for electric guitars and and an oval sound hole. It required an oval, oval sound hole because because you were pushing down the traverse brace had to come down farther. And I have a oval sound hole triple O C 16 uh, E. That's ba I mean triple O C 16. That's basically uh, really an O M 16 because it's long scale and has quarter inch bracing, but it has the skinnier neck, and I absolutely love it. What was that? The MC thirty six. It is the MC. No, my. They had the MC was made in style twenty eight, and style sixty four, I think, which is uh, maple, and ah. um, and I had a triple OC. They had made an OMC twenty eight with the oval sound hole, and they made a triple OC sixteen, um, and it was back when the sixteens were just brought back with the D sixteen and the triple OC. 16 um that had dovetail neck joints and uh and they had tortoise shell when they were other style there's there you go see the black yeah. guard and um and i know they made a fancier one too they definitely made something with a a uh, pearl was that but i can't remember what what's with that oval sand hole then i've never seen that before have i that's because it's got a 22 fret neck so it's a longer i mean a 22 oh. fret fretboard so it's got a longer fretboard and you had to also move the brace down because of the cut deeper cutaway hmm. and so yeah. they had to make the oval sound hole to to accommodate the the brace and the they had to squash the sound hole down it's actually the same diameter and not dia it's the same area it's not actually smaller it's wider but it's actually physically the same uh area of hole as the normal uh, sound hole very cool. And then Mark said same thing. Yeah, regarding M36, is it true it started as an arch top? Yeah, that, I love that story about that guitar store. They, that was a great story. I went there a couple of times. Matt Umanov, he's closed down there, right? He just sells. Actually, he doesn't. Yeah, he, sell he retired. He, he retired. They and... just do. They just do repairs now, but they still sell a few. Yeah, guitars. I'm surprised. I'm surprised that he was his website still online. So I'd bet to ask him about that. I uh, Dick had asked me to be the guitarist in the corner. Dick Boak had mm. his art show at, in New York City a couple of years ago maybe th be three Novembers ago now uh, at Matt's old shop. And um, so I was the guy sitting in the corner playing fingerstyle music all night. But oh, you did that. You were there. there. Yeah. Were you there? Yeah. 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 That was it. That was oh. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Dick said, you know, called me up and said, I'll pay you a lot of money. And I said, I'll do it. <laughs> uh, he said it's that. Great. It's fun. It's fun. <laughs> Steve Earl was there. You know, he looked at you me know, and he said, I, oh. he looked at me and he said, sup. I got to tell you. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I was so disappointed when that happened. I was at the, I was at my, the guy, he's been, Evan's been on my show, does my guitar work for me, and he mentioned that Dick was doing that at the store, and I was, I was meant to go. I, and I, for some reason, I didn't go. I, I missed it, or I just missed it, and because um, Evan had told me that when he went, there was no one there. He was chatting with Dick for like three hours or something, and I thought, darn it, you know, I could have been there. I could have hung out with him, met him. This is before I met him on the live stream I did with him. I was thinking I could have chatted with him and got to know him and seen his work and 
I was so annoyed that I didn't go. Yeah, and it t sure turns did. out if I had it gone, I'd have seen you as well, right? That's correct. And Dick, Dick's oh. a pointillist, if people know what that is, where you lose tiny little dots to make the artwork, and it takes an insane amount of time. But some really awesome, amazing work that he does. Quick shout out to Matt Umanov Guitars. That was a great store. They're still, they're still doing repairs, it looks like. I'm yeah, not sure it's, who's doing he, it. I guess he, I, he still owns the space, but the space it, uh, rents out. Right. But he still owns the space upstairs, which is where the repair, repair shop is. And so. he does he does still sell guitars. Look, there's still some listings here for a few things. I yeah, like I must ask him about that. This might be his personal collection. He may just be selling stuff from his personal collection or selling stuff for friends and stuff. He might be doing that. I wonder if he has any vintage Martins, because what a great guy that would be to chat with, right? Yeah, he certainly had a lot of vintage Oh, look, there's a, there's a tab here called Priceless. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought it was, was going to be um, guitars uh, that you cannot afford to buy. No, oh, there we go. Just, just stuff from his old yeah, Matt's so Matt's so. collection. Yeah, check out that website. That I went there a couple of times, and that was a that was a cool store. That was a really cool store. All right. Anyway, back to our questions. But I love that story with the with the New York Manhattan connection. It's great. So let me find the next one. Yeah, I had to do this because everyone's talking to each other, which is great. I want, you know, we want that, but I want to make sure I can actually see what's a question and what's not. Otherwise, it takes me out ages to scan through them all. So Ro Roeth has the next question, and he says, I had a similar question to Jim. I'd like to hear Spoon's thoughts on the New Yorker models from the 1960s and 70s um, and how they compare to the vintage series. Hmm. So how do they compare to the vintage series? Well, okay, as an amendment uh, to what I said before, they are built lighter. They were they were designed for uh, nylon strings, but you could still play them with with steel strings. And they but they're X brace. They still have X bracing. They have bracing that was uh, based more on the early 1900s Martins. And um, the V series, the vintage series O and double O, were definitely modern guitars. They have that modern um, brick smokehouse build to them that you get out of the vintage series OMs. I don't, not everybody gets to play a modern Martin OM versus a 1930 OM, but the 1930 OM feels like it's just going to float away out of your hand by comparison. And part of that's the steel truss rod, but really the uh, back and sides and top and bracing are all heavier for, for warranty reasons, but you can play the stuffings out of them. That's why Mori can take his own 28 PR and play anything on it you could play on a dreadnought or a les paul and it'll work you know it doesn't it doesn't overdrive the way uh light, lightly built guitars do and so um and those those uh 12 fret uh, vs models are have modern modern build to them so similar to your uh has got his own uh, 18 v same kind of construction and weight basically it's just a more of a 12 fret version with a uh it doesn't actually have a one and seven eighth inch neck. They cheat the neck in, so it's one and thirteen sixteenths. I think they they they're not as wide as vintage guitars. So the the New Yorker models have a wider neck by a little bit. I, I said earlier in the chat, if you like Spoon Phillips, then like this video. And we've got forty three viewers and twenty one likes. That does not add up. So just X out the chat, hit the like button, and then come back in the chat again. <laughs> okay, so. Mark, oh no, Colin. Oh, this is a moan. Are we allowed to have uh, a moan? Colin, we get, can we get uh, a little bit negative on the stream? I hope, uh, Colin, <laughs> I hope that's not bad news from London. Let's bring him on. Colin Larkin, how you doing, buddy? This is a moan, not a question. Should I read it in an angry voice? Us lefties can't try before we buy. Of the 12 new Martins I bought over the years, only two were stock. All the others were ordered from UK dealer Westside. Yeah, that's a shout out for Westside. I thought, I know he, he's watching the uh, West Ham Leicester City game right now, so I thought he might be moaning because of that. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, shout out to, to Westside. Yeah, I mean, Martin, any dealer can order left handed Martins. Almost every model, it'll say right there, it's left handed at no extra charge. And uh, that's unfortunately up to the dealers. Perhaps somebody like Colin, who. Uh, is always looking for something to do, could open a special UK left-handed guitar store. <laughs> there is one of those in Florida. I know there's one in Florida and there's probably some elsewhere as well that all they do is sell left-handed guitars. 
Yeah, I mean, it must be tough being left-handed. It must be tough because I mean, like right now, right? Stock is low. We all know that. And then if you're left-handed as well, stock must be really low. So it must be really tough. And you're right. How do you play them if they've only got the right-handed models in stock? Well, you can turn them around and change the saddle, but you're not getting, and with the traditional Martins, you're not getting the exact same bracing because the, mm. the tone bars that come across the widest part of the bout actually connect touch to the base side brace and that and gets its energy from the base side brace coming from the X brace and they're not connected to the S brace on the other side. So you're definitely not getting the exact same uh, tonal dynamics if you turn them around, take a right hand guitar and turn it around. Okay, oh Rosanna's here. Hi Rosanna, how you doing? Don't forget to put that cue in there because I'm now filtering the comments by the cue. So if you don't put the cue at the front, I don't see it. Okay, don't blame me at the end, please. <laughs> Lee is learning your song Chinatown. Oh, I like that song. His favorite song of yours. Oh, but we don't we don't know a couple of the words near the ending. I'm winding down to something without a sound. Can you please tell us what those words are? That's a great question. Tip, tip <laughs> my hat. So it's, I'm winding down to tip my hat. And right, I'm winding down. Tip my hat without a sound. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Did you get that, Rosanna? <laughs> Let Lee know. And tell Lee when he's finished uh, learning that, I would like a video of it to show on the stream. So let me just put my um, address up. If you want to send a video or a recording in. Yeah, Roeth has done several of your songs now and really well as too. So I encourage more. It doesn't have to be a Spoon Phillips song. You can just strum the open strings if you want to. Okay, I don't want to say everyone's got to learn the Spoon Phillips song. Oh, yeah, no. I <laughs> <laughs> but um, if you've got something to share, send it to say hi at erinshortmusic.com. And perhaps we'll get Spoon to send another cover of a cover of a cover or a cover of his song into into that as well. To that as well. Okay. Bill, how you doing? My question for Spoon is: What is Spoon's advice for how a novice to the brand should begin their search for a Martin? That's a great question. I found the sea of information out there confusing to navigate. That's a great question. Where do you start? Yes, it is. Um... Yeah, there's so much information. There's so many years worth of stuff out there. Uh, there's guitar forums where everybody has an opinion. Um, and I think you need to start a couple. Well, you, there's. I would start with what is it that you're really seeking? Uh, almost everybody looking to buy a Martin already has a guitar and already plays the guitar. So are you looking for what you already have and like, but you want to step up? to the genuine article, if you want to step up from an a inexpensive Asian-built grand concert guitar to an actual 0018 or 0018 and so forth, which is what I did. I grew up playing uh, Jap what Japanese equivalent of a 0018, basically, and or maybe it was Korean. And, um, and uh, or are you looking for something iconic? You've always seen all of your favorite artists playing Dreadnoughts. And you start there, you start with the shape. Um, the most important things, of course, when you're shopping for guitar is sound, which to me is a combination of tone and dynamics and, um, and playability, the feel of it, which is difficult to do if you don't have guitars around to try out different sizes. And that happened to me. Uh, when I finally got a little bit of money together and bought my first Martin, I played a zillion Martins, ended up with a Dreadnought uh, called a Custom 15 that shortly after became the what they would call the HD28V in later years. Vintage neck, big Dreadnought body, long scale, rosewood. After playing a mahogany short scale triplo, it was an enormous change and in comfort and playability. And uh, the V-neck... Uh, just was not prepared for it at all. And then I fell in love with and bought a 1953 0018 from Matt Umanoff and uh, couldn't afford both at the time and sold the Big Martin. Actually, he sold it for me. Um, and um, that was before I learned you can make more money selling your own guitars than giving a dealer some money <laughs> to sell them for you. But, uh, but anyway, that's, you know, that's where you want to start out with. And... Um, and that when it comes to tone, what kind of tone are you really looking for? Uh, for me, 
the sound of an acoustic guitar for me growing up, what I really identified with when I didn't have any idea of guitar brands and didn't know who played what, was Neil Young playing Cowgirl in the Sand uh, solo acoustic on the CSNY 4 Way Street album. That thumpy bass and the clarity of the trebles, and then on the same album, the finger picking David Crosby, uh, although he actually didn't finger pick, he picked with a, he did hybrid picking with a pick and one finger on the, on, uh, along the lee shore. That in my brain was acoustic guitar and Bob Dylan at Concert of Bangladesh, uh, which turned out to be a, uh, a, a D28. And Neil Young was playing, uh, they were both, uh, Crosby and Young were both playing 1968 uh, D45s, rather, the, right when they first started making those, which is Brazilian rosewood with a, uh, what they called German spruce at that time. Nobody really knows what European spruce, nobody knows what country really came from. And um, straight braces. And that was before I even knew what a Martin guitar was. But that sound had gotten into my consciousness of the sound of an acoustic guitar. So what, what song do you love? What sound do you love? What sound do you want to emulate? Um, and then I started asking people, how do you get that sound? That's what I guess I would do. Yeah, that's got me thinking how I my, about my journey. I guess my journey was just to play and go through a lot of guitars. And even now, I'm still not sure which one's my favorite. <laughs> and just, yeah. just, to, just to amend that, not just what sound you're looking for, but what is your own personal style? Yeah. And because almost, almost any guitar from an O to a D, you can play almost any song and it's going to be good enough to accompany your voice. But yeah. obviously, if you're a bluegrasser, if, you are, if you're a huge strummer, if all you do is very light John Denver finger style, the, you know, your choices uh, might be best based on your personal style. Yeah. And then you still have to ask yourself, okay, which guitar is going to give me that? And unfortunately, no, no man sitting on a mountain can tell you that. Like you said, looking at your favorite recordings and artists and what they play is a good place to start. Do you need, do you need a cutaway? Like do you play lots of lead and need to play up the neck, things like that, very basic things to think about. But then within like different woods and things like that, I mean, you know, that's, that's why, that's why I have a YouTube channel and hopefully we can help people with that stuff. But sometimes it comes down to the fact you just got to go out and play those things and listen to them and see what works for you. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a really interesting question. Let us know in the chat what you think. It kind of ties in as well with the poll we've posted about is a dread good for, for which style is it good for? Because I remember being, a, when I was a beginner going on forums years ago and looking at the guitars, I remember seeing that statement. Well, if you play finger style, you've got to buy an OM. And if you strum, you've got to buy a dreadnought. But that's not, um, that's not the case. Yeah, got, got to is, you know, must yeah. have to. It's it's personal. I mean, all you have to do is listen to all the finger style stuff that Stephen Stills does yeah. on a yeah. big dreadnought. Yeah. Um, you know. Oh, I'll throw something else in there too. How the size of you, because like I I, I like this guitar. I feel like a lot of people wouldn't, don't like this guitar. They don't make them anymore because it's got the cutaway and the pickup. And I feel like that's very non-traditional. And a lot of Martin fans like traditional, right? But I am six five, so a dreadnought on me looks kind of dare I say normal. I do. I actually play like mini guitars. For years, I played a, 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 a three quarter size guitar. I, just, I, I thought it was funny, you know, it looks funny, but it was a great guitar too. But I think for me, the size of this, because I'm, I'm bigger, this is different. Whereas if you're maybe smaller, you might want a smaller body. So take all that into consideration as well. How much low end do you want? Because the bigger guitars probably have more low end. But um, I, I, did, you have, did you ever demo this guitar? I really like these um, HDCs. Yes, yeah. In fact, I thought I was going to get a, 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 a DC-28 back when they, yeah. um, back, back when I was looking for guitars. They just had just come out with them. And, and you know, with the, and those days, the uh, volume and tone control were on the shoulder, and it was just a little dial. So they were just little mm -hmm. dial knobs before they came out with the big plate equalizer stuff. But, um, you know, in hindsight, I'm glad I didn't because dreadnoughts were too, too big for me at the time, really. They didn't really fit me i love my dreadnought though now and it's worth you know it's worth putting up with dreadnought shoulder but it's not practical for me to do and and i need a cutaway so i have to have more than one guitar but 
Yeah. That's awesome. the other thing too. The V necks. Um, there are people who play guitars that hurt their hands or are uncomfortable, but they like the sound so much right. that it's worth it to them to do that. And uh, but I think most people are looking for something uh, that they don't realize it yet, but they're looking for something they're going to be able to play for hours and have it be a pleasant experience. And some people don't shop with comfort and playability in mind. And it's a, and, uh, you know, you notice I never mentioned looks once about this. I think it's extremely important to, you can be attracted to guitars for their looks, just like members of the opposite persuasion. But, um, but that's not <laughs> why you buy a guitar, uh, because you won't own it for very long if you just buy it, unless you happen to be lucky. And unless the brains and personality all come with the looks, too, and you just happen to be one of the lucky ones. Um, Spoon yeah. looks on everything, okay? Come on. That's correct. That's correct. <laughs> In fact, with guitars, people talk about looks about looks of a guitar a lot, and I do agree with that to a point, but I've, I mean, I guess the sound has to be the number one factor, right? Doesn't matter how great guitar looks if you don't if you can't stand how it sounds. For me, and sound and sound again is tone and dynamics. There are some guitars that sound wonderfully when you play them lightly that cannot take rigorous strumming. There's some guitars that just explode with tone when you're playing them, but when you try to play softly and they just don't. If you're a dynamic player, you have to pay attention to to uh, dynamics as much as that pretty chord or that beautiful harmonic and um, just like flavor is a combination of, of scent and taste, you know, aroma and taste, uh, tone is, uh, sound is a combination of tone. And, and it's the and same, dynamics. it's the same with people, with anyone, right? The personality is more important than the looks and that's why that's a good thing for us, right? I totally agree. <laughs> I want to ask you, do you have a video to show this week? <laughs> Well, I don't because we're already halfway through and we haven't even got okay. to, we've got so many questions when you're on, I because, like to just run because, the question. Because, because it's halfway through, I thought it'd be a good time for me to feed the cat. Oh, I see. Okay. I basically have a, what's basically a shark circling around me right now. Okay. So if you could do something. Well, I do, for I do actually have one I could up for next week. So I'll just play that. So I'll switch to me and you can go off and do that. Okay. You, I'll you, be right we'll, back. We'll give, we'll give you a three, three minute break. Okay. All right, awesome. So um, I want to thank Spoon for being here. Like I said, I shared Spoon's link in the chat. So please, please, please go. If you haven't already, which a lot of you probably already have done, do go to his website and click on his stuff. All right, he's got an, a fantastic album that everyone loves. So purchase that if you if you listen to it and you like it. Check out his YouTube channel. And if you like it, again, subscribe and ring his bell. <laughs> and make sure you, you help him out with that stuff. And the same with me, if you like what we're doing here, please make sure you're subscribed and ring the bell, press the like button. And like I said, we're kind of halfway through and I've got loads of questions. So the reason I'm doing the queue today, that put the queue before you type your question, is just simply so I can see what's a question and not what you're chatting about. And I did say you can send a super chat. If you're right at the end of the questions and you really have a question you want answered today, you can send me a super chat. I'll bring it right to the top of the list and that'll help me support the channel as well. So while he's feeding the cats, which is a very important thing to do, I'm going to show you a song from a friend of mine. And this is actually the, he's, he's in the chat up, uh, lately as well. And he actually recorded some of the guitars or most of the guitars, actually, the, especially the electric guitars on my solo album, 10 songs about truth, lies and other things. This is one of his songs. And this is a guitar that he bought from me. So check this out. This is this week's viewers comments. And this is Johan Ting. Well, I've been thinking about you for so long. Try to forget you, but you come back twice as strong. Girl, if you only knew what you do to me. To say it's madness wouldn't be a step too far. It's kind of crazy since I don't know who you are. I'm teetering on the cusp of insanity. So when will we beat, oh my baby? 
when will I see this girl in my mind? Well, I got a feeling she's one special lady. I can't wait till the day that I find the one that I've been dreaming of. Calls me on the phone, whispers my name, but how I wish she'd say her wrong. Cause if I knew who she was, I'd seek her out and say hello. So when will we be? Baby, I refuse to repeat Somewhere, somehow I will find you You all can find my thoughts like a mystery And I'll solve it, babe, just to see Well, to win a princess heart I've gotta be a prince But this frog won't sit and wait for the first touch of her lips But right now I'm gonna stop my metamorphosis And wait till the day she arrives Into my life you happen to see her by some chance Be sure to tell her I'll be saving her a dance I'll wait as long as it takes to see her smile Maybe we'll go for a cup of something warm And she'll admit that she's been waiting for a long time for this moment And I'll smile to myself Then maybe after we chat for a while Holy cow, that was awesome. I love that. So, uh, so like I said, Johan there actually played some acoustic guitar and all those, the, the lead guitar on my album. So if you listen to that song in between that I sing a lot, he played the solos in that. Did I play acoustic? Yeah. I can't remember that. It was 11 years ago. I actually had a dream about the producer last night. Maybe because I've been speaking to, to Johan lately on text. But um, I can't remember now if I played acoustic on those songs or not. I think I did. That was that was a James Goodall used guitar that I bought in Denmark, Denmark Street. I still have it in England. Do you remember what's? Do you remember what size it was? My, it was my Goodall. Yes. It's a. It's like a basically like a D18 with a Addy top. And oh, it's got, it was the Dreadnought. And it had a repair on the side, and I've, that's one of the few guitars I did never sold off. It's still in the UK, and I'm gonna one day I'll get that over here because that's a great guitar. I I, yes, I do. Yeah. I don't I don't love mahogany as much as I do rosewood, but. All these dreads I've played with the Addy top, like the Outlaw, just sound really great. You know, I always like those. They're, they're I, great I chime. Yeah. And his guitars yeah. particularly have extraordinary chime. That's really, yeah. that's, it's, uh, he's like a jewel but, box sound. But that guitar, that, that Martin, that he, the acoustic he's playing in that video, there's a whole story behind that, which I haven't got time for today. But I, I wish I had, what, what I, I wish I documented it back then. Well, I met a very famous luthier in Nashville who designed his own pickup, and I wanted this pickup in my guitar. So I went down to a guitar center to find the cheapest Martin that I could, and I got a great deal on this. It was one of those guitar center specials. Um, it's like a GPC, basically, but with, um, it's not rosewood back and sides, it's something else. I can't remember the model now. But um, anyway, Ovencall. anyway, yeah, I think it was, I think it was Urban Call. But, uh, but just to cut that story short, like I never really gelled with the pickup. I actually reviewed the pickup on my channel, but I will say this, at the Nashville show we just went to with Maury, um, they've actually made the changes that I said they should make. Like I said there should be a mic in there and the saddle should be not individual piezos, but one piezo. And they've now done that. So it's where I, maybe in the future I'll re-review that pickup. But when, when Johan was visiting us in, in New York, he bought that from me. And the interesting thing with that guitar, finally, is it's got, as part of that pickup system, he also put a sound port in it. And that's why I asked you about the sound port. But that that GPC that you told me about with the sound port is it looks great. I was actually looking for those on Reverb. They look amazing, but they only made fifty of them. 
GP, yeah. It didn't the have the C. It was an Ankara one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that looked like a really cool So, uh, so Aaron <laughs> Short, influencer, um, they actually made the changes you wanted. That's pretty cool. That's I don't know if... I, I don't know if my video offended them or if they took that on board or if they were going to do that anyway. But I rewatched it after I got back from them and I thought, yeah, the things that I said are the things they've now changed. So I yeah. should really don't reach sell, out to them and don't have sell a. yourself short. Well, you <laughs> know. I know, very funny. Hang on, you need one of these. Hang on. <laughs> All right. So actually, I like that. I want, I want more videos because it's nice to have that break in the middle. I was actually watching a new show last night where he's just playing. Um, people's viewers videos and it was really fun so i like having that format in the middle so once again send me stuff to play in the break in the future it's very cool stuff and thank you johan and thank you for your um playing on my album yeah that's great great fun so next up we have the one and only kooky 79 good friend of the show and he says what do you think about the two and three eight inch spacing, string spacing on the late OM eighteen V? Well, I think I um, wanted to answer this question. I saw it fly by the last time I was on the show, and I've been meaning to get an uh, email for you. Um, so I'd like to say to everybody right now, if questions we don't have time for every question, and you have questions for me, you can always write to me at one man at one man's dot com. That's one man's with a Z, one man at one man's dot com. That's my email address that I get uh, guitar questions from all over the world every week, and I try to answer them as soon as I can. So the the two and three eighths. Uh, this uh, this ties into something else too because I didn't get to uh, see the Owen Twenty Eight VR video uh, show that Aaron and Maury did just recently until after the fact. I had to watch the replay of it. The, the 1930s Martins were officially spec for two and three eighths inch string spacing. The very first 14 fret uh, Martins of any note were the original OMs. Um, and so the OM 45V came out with two and three eighths string spacing. One and three quarter inch neck, two and a quarter at the 12th fret, and two and three eighths string spacing. And almost every pre-war 1930s OM built between uh, 1930 and 1933 has that spacing. And then, the, uh, but the OM28V had two and five eighths uh, spacing, five sixteenths spacing. And at the time it came out, nobody at Martin could tell me why. <laughs> and, uh, and I really liked that spacing a lot. And then the OM18V came out a year later in 1999, and I bought the very first one that arrived in New York City, having been waiting and lobbying Martin to, to make an OM18 again, which they hadn't done since the 1930s. So I bought the first one. Uh, that string spacing is really great for the right hand, for the picking, particularly if you are not a very precise uh, musician. So people just learning figure style, people who are uh, very emotional in their playing, like me, and, and having that wide string spacing is good. Uh, it's more difficult on the fretting hand because everything's wider and, and all your muscles and everything is hitting something just a little wider across that fretboard. So, uh, and that had a big V-neck by modern standards. And, and it, you know, it had a modified V-neck in those days. Every neck was carved differently. It, uh, I believe, was personally responsible for turning my old sports injuries from high school into a problem, the, the repetitive stress of that. And it's the only guitar I really regret selling because it was sounded awesome. Um, and so that string spacing of the traditional OMs, good for the right hand, hard on the left hand for me, and then when they came out with the OM28 Authentic 1931, it had two and five eighths street spacing like the Vintage series. And then it turned out that at least one batch of OM28s made in 1930 had two and five eighths string spacing. Again, nobody knows why. The ledger doesn't tell us. Did a particular dealer order them that way? 
they don't know. And by coincidence, the guitar they chose to make the authentic model from was Mike Seeger, the folk singer Mike Seeger's personal guitar that had that string spacing. They probably, he was from Pennsylvania, they probably uh, used it for the vintage model too, and it didn't occur to anybody at the time. So for some odd reason, uh, the, the 28V had 16th inch narrower than the 45 and the 18. So that's the long version, because I meant to write Kooky and tell him all that. <laughs> well, thanks for sharing oh, also, that. Also, the uh, Marquis series and the Golden Era series, all two and three eighths. All those OMs are two and three eighths inch, and as mm. is the uh, OM18 authentic. So I keep thinking a Marquis custom shop with the standard series neck could be a really great guitar. Oh, I totally agree. Yeah. But I'm not brave enough to do it. <laughs> so someone else do it and let me know how it is. <laughs> yeah, and, moder and modern OMs, and by that I mean the OMs they started making in 1990 for the standard, what's now the standard series, have always been two and a quarter inch, and so are the Jubu models, and that's actually a little narrow, and I, I never cared for that. I would like the slightly wider two and five eighths. Now I'm, I got used to the two and quarter over the years, so, um, and now the only OM with that spacing is the, OM, is the uh, modern deluxe OMs. And have the traditional wider fretboard so they're two and a quarter oh on sunday was it sunday someone asked asked me to talk about the modern deluxe and i said ask me on either today or thursday but they're not here so i'm not going to talk about that but that's that's a topic for another time is yeah, your sister allowed to ask a question i don't see why not as long as it's, <laughs> she long says, as it's not about you, our childhood <laughs> do you remember do you remember the 10 bucks i lent you last week no i'm just kidding uh <laughs> What, oh, great question. What is your favorite current model? And if you could have any from the history, what would it be? Wow. That's a great question. Uh, well, I'll ask the second one first. It would probably be the uh, OM45 Deluxe that Roy Rogers owned. Um, not because Roy Rogers owned it, but because it's, uh, it was one of those thing, guitars that you could, you could play alone in a room for probably six hours and, and never be unhappy. It was just, uh, just wonderful neck, wonderful, effortless tone. You just could totally get lost in, and um, so that would be it. And um, the though any of those old uh, Rosewood OMs from 1930 would be up there, I'm sure. Uh, the modern day Martins. Um, my hand doesn't like the modern neck, so that limits me quite a bit. So that aside, I think. Uh, I still think the OM28 that's that's based on the old OM28V is still probably the most versatile all-around Martin uh, for me. Um, and uh, the uh, but being made right now, I mean, it's hard to it's hard to top the Authentics. It's hard to top the OM28 Authentic 1937 in terms of just sheer. I want that wow factor. I really want to play that with you and talk about that guitar because there's some things about it that on paper do not work for me. But when I played one at the NAM show, I, I really connected with it. But then I went and played one at a guitar center and didn't like it at all. I mean, sometimes we've spoken about that in the past as well, where you the guitar you play, where you play it, and things like that. But I'd love to like analyze the neck shape yeah, the, and things the like why, that. The why of the guitar center guitar would be interesting. Yeah, too, but that's another yeah. conversation. Yeah, that'd be fun to do. Jasper, thank you for the super chat. You didn't even send a question. You just sent the super chat. So I appreciate it. Here we go. Okay, so hang on, I've lost my place now because I came down to Jasper. <laughs> All right. Um, Philip Watson, here we go. Philip was mad at me earlier because I didn't tell him to put a cue. Now I've got a cue from Philip Watson. Spoon. Can the custom shop add a sound hole rosette to an older guitar? For example, I'd like the J40 rosette on my 2001 HD 28 VS. Ooh, cool guitar. Um, I don't see why not. Yeah, they could. You could probably have it done as well or cheaper by having uh, somebody else do it who does that kind of work. Um, you could probably even get, I'm not sure, Philip, I don't remember where you reside. Do you remember if he's in the States or if he's in Texas, I think. Oh, excellent. Okay. Well, I would recommend you get a hold of Dale Tract, who did the Pearl for Martin uh, until the early retirement offer 
a few years back. He's still in business. He does pro work. He lives in uh, Pennsylvania, not that far from Martin. And if it was me, I would get a hold of him and have him do it. You'd get it back a lot faster than waiting in line for the eight zillion other people uh, that the custom shop and repair department is working for. You could also, if you cared about it, you could also get it done in solid abalone shell. Um, though the right. modern day uh, veneer stuff that they uh, that everybody uses these days is guaranteed you to, guaranteed to give you the better, brighter color and all that stuff because they they put the they glue the best looking stuff on the outside. That is a great question because I never thought about that before. Like, could I take this Martin I already own and say, I don't want a new one, I want this one, but can you just add the abalone rosette, which I'm a huge fan of, I always talk about that. Can you just add There's, it for me? I've never heard of that there, before. There are some caveats coming with that because depending on what you're replacing, the thing they're going to replace it with has to be at least as wide. Mm. So it might not be the exact spec of what Martin used if, if that trench is already wider than it would be. So I can't tell you off the top of my head how wide is the piece of abalone on the sound hole rosette of a J40, for example. And how does that fit with the black and white proof purfling that you have? If what you want is an abalone rosette inlaid into that, they could probably save some of the outer rings and put abalone inside it, and I don't know if it's going to, you know, be exactly the same as a, you know, J40. So you, if you, what you really want is the exact rosette, you'd have to ask. But yeah, I, Aaron, that's how uh, that's how Longworth got involved with Martin uh, when Martin stopped making pearl trim guitars in 1942. Uh, people started seeking people out like Michael Longworth to turn their D28 mm -hmm. into a D45. He did that for multiple big stars in Nashville. And when Martin was going to bring back the D45 in 1968, they hired uh, Longworth. Hmm. And he became the company historian because he knew more about vintage Martins than anybody at the factory did because in those days, all they cared about was new Martins. And so they weren't thinking about uh, old Martins. So who, um, who, who is he? I've ne never heard the name before you spoke about him. Yeah, you'll hear his name a lot. People refer to the Longworth. He, when he came in to uh, do, uh, to do the Pearl of OM D45s, and then he also was responsible for, um, for the original D40. D D40 had more Pearl on it. It was a more of a limited edition thing. He designed that. He also said, uh, people, you know, said, came and said, can you do the snowflakes of the pre 1938 D45s? And he said. Um, well, yeah, but why don't we just put it on the front and not put it on the back and charge a lot less for it? And that's where the D42 came from. Style 42 doesn't look anything like that, the old Style 42, but that had been retired years ago, and they never thought they were going to bring it back, so they called it the D42. And then he found the archives upstairs at the old factory, which were basically boxes, cardboard boxes filled with documents, zillions of documents. And he was the guy that actually went in there and put them together. And he wrote the first history of the Martin Guitar Company, and which is back here on my the book at the tops, the first edition. The little blue book is the one that most people know. That's a later edition. There's a lot of uh, updates, and and he had you know he had limited stuff to go on. So there is a, there are actually a lot of little errors uh, in terms of production numbers and stuff in the in Longworth. Mm. But that's that's where it started and. Dick Book, basically, when he retired from customer service and took over as archivist, Mike Longworth was the guy that started all that stuff. And mm. uh, he was unceremoniously fired uh, one day by, uh, in a brief period after Chris's dad was unceremoniously retired from the company, and a, a guy named uh, Bloom uh, was his last name, Tigger Bloom was his name, uh, was te the president of the company and te all of a sudden it kind of, uh, you know, they looked at the books and nobody was buying acoustic guitars in those days and they did a sudden big first attempt to corporatize and Longworth was just literally asked to clean out his desk and uh, a lot of people consider it one of the, the blacker marks in Martin history. And, hmm. uh, the cat agrees. I'm a little busy right now. <laughs> categories, categories. Yeah. Um, Stop it. Come on. My my cats have started meowing a lot recently. 
I think we started giving them too many treats and they expect treats every day. Well, she's, yeah, she's, uh, <laughs> long story, she's got PTSD. She was a, uh, a, a, a rescue and she relies on me tremendously for her reinforcement. So I'm her support dog. I wish I could have the cats in here with me on the stream, but they would just eat all of my cables. So they're not, they're not allowed in this room. Like, I, I totally understand. You know, during a recent heat wave here in Austria, I did not play my guitars out of fear that my sweat could be bad for the lacquer on the back. Stupid or is there such a danger? No. Uh, I have some thoughts on this it, as well. It depends on, it depends on your sweat. The fella mm. that, uh, a fella that Maury plays with a lot, is famous for having really corrosive sweat. Toxic sweat. Yeah. And, and but it's really just strings. His he will destroy strings in one session, and uh, yeah, and he's the first person to, to say it. But but no, the lacquer is going to be fine with sweat. Uh, the sweat will build up. It's always a good idea to, to wipe your guitars down, even if you don't do them all the time. Mm. Even just a tiny bit of water and a, and a nice um, microfiber cloth is usually all you need. I have uh, these. These are people, nice. People, yes, people use NAMFA, which is uh, lighter fluid. You can use lighter fluid. You just want to make sure you're not near open flame and make sure you throw out the the towels that, you know, or wash the towels. That's really good for lacquer. And, and what it does is it cuts, just cuts through the muck really quickly. Um, you want to be very careful about uh, leaving your guitars unplayed in severe, severe humidity or in severe humidity changes because sitting without lowering the strings. If you're going to put your guitars away for any number of days, it's always a good idea to detune the strings at least a little bit. Um, if you're going to let them go and you know you're in an unusual uh, state of weather that's going to be fluctuating because that's going to put a lot of pressure on the top and, the, and it's that pull of the unplayed strings. Um, that's why people who have a lot of guitars, they usually detune the strings till they're loose and, and uh, to, and store them that way for that reason. This happened to me because the uh, my OMJM on the back has gone really. It looks like it's kind of cloudy. Like, yeah, yeah. Is there a way? That's what I was, I was, I've been thinking. Like, how, how would I get rid of that? The thing is, the I, Martin the Martin finish does kind of. I know it scratches up and it and it wears through and everything. I know that's the way it is. But though, I've never seen those kind of marks on the back of that guitar before. Cloudiness. Uh, that definitely was environmentally related. I had a lot of cloudiness show up on the headstock of my Dreadnought, which for people who don't know, uh, is back in size of a, of a 60s Martin, but that had been destroyed. So it was retopped and got a new neck put on it by the guys at Brothers Music in Pennsylvania who used to work at the factory. And, um, and that finish clouded up on the headstock really badly. And I was keeping a humidifier pouch right under that headstock, you know, with a sponge in it. And I took it out and it took about two years and it all just slowly went away. Um, so that was my, my uh, clouding was definitely caused by over humidification. Your clouding could have been caused by some sort of chemical reaction with whatever you got on it. And sometimes that stuff just goes away. Sometimes you can have it buff. You can take it to somebody who can buff it and see if yeah. it will buff out. But, people uh, are going to say, don't worry about it. I agree. People are going to say, don't worry about it, yeah. But I do think the Martin finish does um, scratch up and get sweat and dull very quickly. Yeah, it's, re it's real nitro nitrocellulose yeah. lacquer. It's, yeah. it's an organic material that that is porous, and it actually breathes. It'll, when they talk about it breathing, it, allows, it actually mm. allows the air to get to the wood in a very controlled manner. And so that's why they uh, – that's and it ages, and that's why the guitar's – continue to sound better and better and better as you play them um, in a way that the heavy polyurethanes uh, lacquer that you get on Collins guitars and stuff like that simply it's not it doesn't do that it's not the same um, so you get what you pay for in more than one way <laughs> all right another question about what guitar would you choose I like these questions so hi welcome oh. circumstance here we go Welcome and welcome to the channel. I see some new names here, so please subscribe if you like what we're doing. He says, if you could have only one guitar and the choices were the following, which would you pick? Okay, we'll both do this. Ready? So here are your yeah. choices. They they have to be new. You can't you can't say a used guitar or or a yeah. vintage guitar. Yeah. So, a D twenty eight, H D twenty eight, D twenty eight modern deluxe, or a D forty one. 
Do you want me to go first, or do you want to go first? Uh, you go first. Okay, I'm going to say the standard D28. I, mm. uh, wow, I'm shocked. I, I have a forward-shifted, scallop-braced. The guitar I have has real 19, 19 uh, you know, 37 bracing on it, so it's uh, basically authentic. But I would go with the non-scallop-braced D28. I really like the clarity. Scallop bracing is very seductive. Um, but every time I hear a D28 in somebody else's hands, uh, yeah. or the old D18 that was before they had scallop bracing, I really like the sound. And the, and granted, the modern one is forward shifted, which the sound makes it sound a little different. It's a little, it's a little tubbier in the low mids than it used to be. It's a little meatier than uh, before they forward shifted it. But but uh, they record really well. They sound so clear in another group of guitars. So that's my that's my. Uh, but hang on, if you could have one only, meaning only one guitar, nothing else. So your collection's oh. gone. Well, he's you asking pick? me. I would definitely go with the non scallop because I already have scallop. It would be the HD twenty eight. Right. If that's I what, could only that's, have one. That's, that's what, what I thought. I would that's what I thought. Yeah. So for me, this is something I came up against recently, reviewing that D twenty eight Amori's guitar. Because I've always loved the H D twenty eight, the standard series, which is no um, secret on this channel. And this is based on that as well, the colorway one. So I love that. I do love that too. The D41, I like the D42. I'm, I'm disappointed the D42 is not there because I've, I've always liked the D42. But nope. HD, I know. So, okay. So I would pick HD. Well, this is, this was really tough for me. And this is my honest thoughts about it. A new fresh, a fresh set of strings on a D28 does have that mid-range punch that is really nice. The, and I get what you mean about the HD being seductive with the scallop bracing. It has that sparkle and that kind of mid cut, which is a nice thing, for, especially for strumming. And the extra reverb, you get that, you get a yeah. reverb, yeah. the extra reverb. Yeah, cut to but, it. but this is this is what I've been thinking about this a lot, because in my video, I really, I don't like, to, I never like to be on the fence, right? I want, I want to say in my video, would I buy the D28 or the HD28? Because I had them both here. So which one would I buy? And I was on the fence, I went, I, I kind of leaned towards the HD because I've always been a fan of that guitar. But I could see so clearly why people like the D28, especially if you're, if you're doing like bluegrass, because it was going to cut through and project more. But I ended up thinking, and this is the truth, and this will sound really, <laughs> it's going to sound crazy, but I wish there was something kind of in the middle of the two. <laughs> <laughs> That's a talk for another day, because there are luthiers that only scallop bracing on one side. And you know, on the on the uh, bass side, not the treble, or on the treble, or not the bass side. I think that's what it is. But I have to amend mine. I got to change my answer to the modern deluxe because oh, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, no, I must because I forgot. I can't play the modern neck. The modern uh, modified low oval uh, is it hurts my hand too much, and it gets worse. The more the more I play it, the more it hurts. It hurts up here, and it hurts in the wrist, and it's just something about that shape. And the modern deluxe has that. Uh, vintage deluxe neck based on the 1930 ohm deluxe, uh, ohm 45 deluxe at the factory, and I love that neck. I totally forgot about that. I would have to go with the modern deluxe, and the modern deluxe sound to me is not a traditional Martin sound. It's a new sound, so I really like uh, the sound of the standard series Martins. And um, but um, again, when I hear people playing them online, and I hear Maury playing them the clarity and the definition of it. And you get the depth from the torification. You get that like bottomless pit basement. That's the one thing that they have in common with real vintage guitars, that 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 uh, three-dimensional aspect to it. So I guess, particularly if I was somebody was giving me one, but yeah, if I could buy one with that cost was an, an option, I would say I would go with the Modern Deluxe because the neck is just I, important I just I haven't it. bonded with the modern deluxe. I thought when I when they announced it, I thought I really would. Even just for the Evo fret wire, I thought this is my guitar. But the neck for me, maybe I'm too used to this neck. The neck for me, and the sound for me, I, I still I still think I prefer the standard series. But I I I really want guitars now with with stainless steel frets. So, I think I think for me, like I should be leaning more towards custom shop stuff. But they, I I would just get so nervous about doing a custom order. And not knowing what's going to show up, but um, I, I, I think I would still pick the the standard series 
8, standard series HD 28. If the D42 was on there, I would have taken that one, I think. Yeah. So, Spoon kind of mentioned them all, <laughs> apart from the D41. <laughs> And I'll, I'll pick the HD28. The D41 now is the D HD28V with Pearl, yes. and uh, yeah. but yeah. but not along the fretboard because you have to have style 42 to have it yeah. along the fretboard. And um, but it's also got upgraded woods, and of course they say it's cosmetic, but um, but you're getting you're definitely getting uh, a better top. And I got of I got a couple of people in the chat. Um, you're not blocked, but if I get any messages that are not appropriate, of course, I will block anyone that I need to do that to. But uh, I'll leave it at that. All right, next question. Uh, Thomas Moore says, question, is Triple O Twenty Eight and Triple O Twenty Eight Eric Clapton? I think he I think he asks with Oh yeah, here we go. Again later do they do they okay. Do the Triple O Twenty Eight and Triple O Twenty Eight Eric Clapton sound the same? And is the Triple O Twenty Eight Modern Deluxe close or way different? That's a very interesting question, Tom, because because um, I have not actually played a mod the right now modern Triple O Twenty Eight next to a Triple O Twenty Eight EC. So the only real difference between them now, as far as I know, uh, the Twenty Eight EC now has the exact same wood grades as the 28. The only difference is the V-neck. And the bigger neck, anybody who, who has been around uh, Martins throughout the years, dealers and stuff, will tell you privately that a big neck definitely affects the sound. Having more mass to the neck is going to affect the sound. How much, to what degree, uh, does it, is it so little that it doesn't matter? If you had 10 triple O 28s and 10 triple O ECs, would you know and would blindfolded people with really good ears be able to tell the difference probably not because they're so similar um the ecs cost a little more because of the extra stuff you get on it cosmetically and his signature and a and a percentage of it goes to his charity uh which i'm assuming is the crossroads foundation and um so i can't think of any actual difference structurally uh, between the two, the modern deluxe, completely different ball of wax. The the bridge plate's different. The top's torrified. The top has torrified. Uh, maybe it doesn't have torrified bracing, but it has it has Adirondack golden era scallop bracing, and uh, they no longer have a uh, titanium neck rod, which a lot of people don't know. They've gone to stainless steel neck rod because they couldn't. Wherever it was being sourced from, COVID kind of blew that up. So, so they no, uh, they no longer have a titanium uh, alloy neck rod. Hmm. But um, EVO frets probably have nothing to do with the sound. But the tone is definitely different on the modern deluxes from their standard series counterpart uh, from the torrefaction alone. On the on the torrefaction, people don't know is where they treat wood under extreme heat. Uh, under uh, in an oxygenless environment, uh, so they don't combust, and and it changes the it uh, crystallizes the molecular structure inside, so they greatly resemble wood that's uh, many decades old, even hundreds of years old, depending on how how long you toast the wood. So it's it's the latest technology over the past 20 years or so. I'll just throw this in here: a, a famous Martin connected person told me they don't like, and this, this isn't Spoon Phillips, this is someone else, but I don't want to say who it was. They told me they don't, they're not a fan of VTS because it removes some of the frequencies that they want to have in there. And um, I've noticed that as well, I feel. Um, but having said that, I did like the vintage guitar that I played at NAMM, and that is VTS. So I think I want to do, personally, I want to do more research into that because I know there's different levels of VTS as well. Yeah, it definitely opens. I mean, I, they call it opening up and breaking and breaking it in and stuff. And basically, they're artificially aging it. That's what they call it. So it's not going to change in age that the way that a normal brand new guitar is going to change. Mm. That's already kind of been done in terms of seasoning and the top drying out. In terms of the wood rattling around for 70 years, nobody knows because nobody's there aren't torrified guitars that are that old. There are violins that are that old. They've been doing torrefaction on violins since the early 1800s. But mm. but um but to me, when you strum a brand new guitar, it's kind of like, and this is much more for Adirondack than anything else, it's kind of like 
it's kind of like a stone skipping across the lake. And you have that flat stone, boom, 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 and then eventually hits kind of sinks in. With Torah faction, that that playing really already goes way down on the voice, like right then and there in brand new guitar. It really is a pretty phenomenal thing. And it's quite noticeable when you play very similar guitars, one with and one without. Um, but yeah, I think it does it does change some stuff in the in the uh, overtones and things that that I don't equate with vintage guitars. Um, and but you know certainly well if every person here is in the same room, certain people are going to really love the sound of the the VTS guitar, and other people are going to prefer the other one. That's just the way that the world works and the ears work and the brains work. Uh, next up is Jim it says. The 016 NY I'm looking at has light 12 gauge strings. That sounds like a no no. Oh, because of the whole neck reset thing, right? I don't know because I haven't played the one. Like I said, I'm not familiar with the ones from the 80s. I'm not sure how different they are. I'm pretty sure that they recommended 10s uh, back in the day and in the 60s and uh, or silk and string, silk and steel, which you can have, I think, silk and steel are 12s but there's there's still less tension in them um so i don't know and you should check because you know you can have 12s these days that are actually flex core strings and so that it's a different uh you can have 12s that are still uh still have less tension than than traditional 12s i don't think so i mean if you played it and there's nothing i mean how long ago was that you're talking 30 years if it's lasted 30 years with light strings and it's Still seems structurally sound, then I wouldn't even worry about it. Okay. I just want to take a, this opportunity as we've got 40 watching to say thank you for the thumbs up. We've got 34. That's great. And I just want, I want to jump over to one man's quickly just to give him a really good plug because I want to make sure that you know where to go to see this info. I'll, I'll be coming back with more questions in a second. So this is the link that I've been posting in the chat. Jump over to the desktop here. Right, so go on here. There's loads of information. There is a way to contact Spoon directly. There's a link to subscribe to his YouTube channel. And the album is here as well. Where's the album? I'm on the wrong page. But there's a link to the album here as well. You can go back to the main page. And you can donate to him as well. So definitely check that out this evening. And, you know, show him some love there, over there. And there's, there's a link there to my musician site at the top, TSP Guitar. That's also, you can buy the... The, the link here to buy the album takes you to my personal site. So, okay, great. Is it at the top? Is it at the very top? The top, uh, the top, topmost above that menu. There's another menu above the picture of me holding a guitar. Oh, up so, here, right? One man's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one one man's world. That's the. Oh, you don't see it. Maybe it's not there. Maybe I meant to put it up there. It's not there. Anyway, it's on there. There's so much stuff on yeah, there. I mean, yeah, look at look at all these stuff. articles is written. Right, you're gonna to have to go and read that later on tonight. <laughs> and I want to thank Spoon for being here, filling in for Maury to, today. It's great. And let us know in the chat if we're allowed to have Maury back again when he gets back from that vacation. Uh -huh. Is on. <laughs> all right. So we're gonna do another about 30 minutes. So like I said, if there's a really pressing question you want to ask then um, send me a super chat. If not, we'll just fit in as many as we possibly yeah, can. Yeah, I'll try that. We'll go into a speed round now, and I'll try to keep my yeah. answers yeah. short. Yeah, okay. Short. <laughs> so, my D35 came with medium strings, 13 gauge, obviously because it's a dread. So Martin do ship the dreadnoughts with 13 gauge strings, usually. I think the, the ones with pickups and colorways were coming with 12s. But anyway, most dreads come with 13s. Wouldn't light be better because the D35 has quarter inch bracing? Should I change them quickly? No, they, the 35 uh, has been around a long time with uh, non scallop uh, quarter inch bracing. I'm assuming the HD 35 with the scallop bracing even also comes with 13s. Um, that's up to you. I, I play 12s because, because my hands and wrists just aren't as strong as they used to be, and, and, so, and I like to bend. Excuse me. Bend the strings more. Thirteens, I think, give a more ro robust and um, powerful sound. So it's always a trade-off. For many years, I would use a mix set, and I would because I play in dad gad a lot. So whether it was a dreadnought or or an OM, I would play with a medium gauge strings on the unwound strings and on the low E string because I would drop that down to D or even C at times and keep the uh, the middle three strings, the A, D, and G 
as light strings. And it would cost me because I use Martin Striggs, I, I would have to buy two sets. Um, the Lawrence Juber set actually is, uh, comes that way, but it's the uh, it's the nickel uh, alloy uh, Monel strings, um, like the retro strings, and that they, I I don't think they work with every guitar, so I don't tend to. I have some sets, but I I don't tend to use those. I think you're fine with twelves. If you want to change, and try. I, I, again, some people will say a dreadnought has to have thirteens because it drives the top more, and that's what they designed for it, but. I think most of my most of my dreads have 12s because I want to bend the string as well. I did. I, there was this time when I practiced hours every day with 13s on the guitar, and I quickly built up the strength to play them. And they do they do have a, a good sound. It, it's again it's very personal preference, but yeah, 12s or 13s. And again, you can get flex score. They have a little less tension and allow you to bend them, but mm. they still have. They're kind of an in between. They make yeah. one yeah. set of 12 uh, 12.5s. They only make them in golden ear and. Uh, Phosphor bronze. Dick Boke came up with those. They don't make them in 8020s anymore, which is too bad because that's what I that used to be my goatee string. That is literally between half all the strings are halfway between light and medium, and uh, you can try those two. But uh, for flat pickers, they dreadnoughts are still thought of as a bluegrass guitar. So mm. people who play flat picks with big heavy picks, they like the usually like to have their strings. I noticed that with the elixir strings, they have a bit more tension than some other strings, so they feel tighter, even though they're the same gauge. And if you go, you know, if you're not used to short scale, and you buy a short scale guitar, and you think the strings are too, too waggly yep. and too floppy, you put mediums on and try them out. You yep. may may like yep. the difference. Or elixir because they have a bit, bit more tension. Yeah. Because all all strings have different tension, right? Uh, Lisa says, thank you, Aaron Spoon from Big Sister. Lisa Faith, thanks for your support. Lisa, thanks for sharing on your Twitter. I re I appreciate that. John says, after lowering the saddle, how do I get some tone and volume back again? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, so you lowered the saddle and you lost tone and volume. Oh, I've, um, I've noticed that myself, yeah. So I'm trying to think physically what's happening to cause that. One thing you could do is what we just talked about. You could go to medium strings and see if that, if that, if you can stand that or go to the in-between strings or I mean, if you look, if you're not playing, if we're not talking Martin strings, like Aaron pointed out, different, different makers have different gauges, um, whether it's new tone or whoever it is, um, you can experiment with that. That's the first thing you would have to do. Uh, if your saddle isn't bone, I would say get a bone saddle. If you're using a micarta or, or uh, tusk or, uh, you know, a man-made saddle, I would say, uh, you're going to get the most tone out of bone. Um, and um, I don't know. I'm just saying off, off the top of my head. I'm not sh quite sure. Maury might be better at this because he's run into this more and he deals with saddles more than I do. If Tony Phillips was on here, Anthony Phillips, he would certainly <laughs> have something to say about that. He's made tons of saddles for people and, and deals with this kind of stuff all the time. So he would be, that would, it's too bad he's not here today because he would certainly have an opinion on that. I think the, the the higher saddle and high, greater break angle definitely gives more tone, and I think that's one of the one of my theories about when you install like an anthem. There's this whole thing about does the under saddle pickup affect the tone? I think what I've had done in the past is taken like an OM28 that sounded incredible to someone, and they've put that pickup in, but also lowered the saddle and things like that, and changed the action, which has also influenced the, the change in the tone. But on the other hand, if you want a low action you sometimes have to make that sacrifice, right? I do know that uh, some people believe, or, or I'm sure it's true, that if you have a, Martin has a, a non-notched bridge uh, pinholes, and they have the notches in the pins. And a lot of people believe if you have the opposite, you, um, you have non-notched pins and a notched saddle, you get a better brake angle and you get a better tone. And some people will, is that, did I say that right? Yeah. And some people will do that. They will notch, the person I just mentioned, he notches saddles, uh, bridges for people. And he does it on his guitars, includes his Martins. And he'll either just turn the pins around so they're not notched or he'll buy non, uh, notchless pins. It's another option, possibly. Yeah, I've seen those. I've seen those power pins. Power, power pins. Well, the one thing that will give you more volume, certainly, is if you buy those super expensive lux pins that martin makes mm. that are made with liquid uh metal which is a actually a uh 
it's actually a, a, a molecularly, chemically a form of glass. It's got, and it uh, definitely increases sustain and volume uh, yeah. considerably. I reviewed those for Maury and I, I, I did notice a difference. I don't love the way they look, though. I wish they just made them look traditional, but with that. Yeah, they have a white. They have to make them a certain thickness. They do make they well. They may not sell them, but they definitely made them in a faux white look uh, for some uh, limited edition model. I don't remember which one it was. Yeah, I, I like the traditional look, but they definitely made a difference to the tone. Um, okay, so Jim says my three-year-old Martin O2 X M A E. And please explain what that means to a spoon. First two frets are wearing on the first and second string. Is this to be expected? Yeah, for me it is. Because <laughs> I play all the cowboy chords down there. What do you think about that? Well, Martin has been criticized for their frets for many, many, many years because they wear out pretty quickly. And, um, and but most people, they don't wear out enough that it becomes an issue. So if you look, a lot of people you don't, won't even notice until you, you pull your strings over and you'll start seeing all the divots that are showing up in them. And refretting your, and most people won't refret two frets. They'll only refret if you get in the whole set. And that's like, I don't know, $200 these days maybe. Hold it still so it focuses. There you go. You can see that notch there by the diamond. I get them so, straight away. I've noticed on, on that, that's why I'm really in, into the idea of stainless steel frets. Because I notice if I get a brand new guitar, and I, you know, I, I do play up the neck, but I play, I was kidding before, I do play a lot down here. And here, let me just go here. Oh, I muted him, hang on. There we go. I do play a lot down here, obviously, because I'm singing, right? I'm accompanying myself like this. And I find that you can see those divots within even a couple of weeks or months. Weeks, I mean, that's a, maybe a bit, but definitely but a, couple of, a couple of months. Do you hear like, the difference? Do you feel it's affecting your intonation? Do you feel it's affecting your sound? No, but the fact they're starting to come means if I keep playing them, I am going to get, they're obviously going to get bigger. And I have had some guitars re-crowned in the past. They'll just re-crown or re-fret certain frets. So you can just yeah, have these they ones crowned. Yeah, when they crown the frets, they just, they're just filing them down and smoothing it out. Yeah. And that's yeah. different than, than re-fretting and uh, doing a full refret. And Lawrence gets a refret. Every one of his guitars goes to the factory every year. Yeah, uh, every but, one of the guitars he plays. But that's Lawrence, that's Lawrence Jew. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he can afford to do it. Um, if I had Grammys, I would do it too, probably. But but I don't, you know. If it's becoming a problem for you, then you have to have it addressed. And unfortunately, I'm pretty sure that's never been covered by the warranty, which is why people complain about it. That's something that's based on playing where it's not something that's covered from the warranty, in the, by the warranty. It is to be expected, because that's my experience. It's also got to do with things like how hard you grip it, how, much, how often you play on those frets, obviously, because you're wearing it, wearing it down. And then eventually, if you love a guitar, you can always have it refretted like Maury did with stainless steel frets. I just, I just have this idea lately that I don't want to have to take my guitar to a repair shop unless I have to, of course, with the pandemic. But now, even now, now I'm more used to setting up my own guitars. I don't want to have to take it to be done. So I like the idea of finding the guitar that works for me and say I do commit to one guitar, I would have it re-threaded re with stainless steel frets. I think I would just do that. And it's going to last me. I mean, Maury did that, right? Did it to his guitar. So there you go. Have you got any thoughts on Evo or stainless frets? Do they, do they appeal um, to I, you? I was surprised how noticeably sore my fingers were playing evo frets but i'm assuming you get used to it pretty quickly i think the guitar that brothers did for me might have stainless steel frets because it's miraculously it doesn't have any fret work so i'm assuming that's what they put in there i never asked them about it um, um you have a light touch but that's the other thing too is most of us uh most of us did not start playing guitar with teachers that really knew what they were talking about and stayed with mm. the teacher for a long time and most of us play press way too hard, too hard yeah. for us most of us think we're pressing on pressing on the fretboard and yeah. you're not really even supposed to touch the fretboard if you but, were if you were learned properly and i certainly play way to press too hard and also, i think yeah pushing no, in on that fret is a big part of it what, what happens to me is when, when i was starting out like getting on stage the first time it's great the nerves can make you if you get open mics regularly and you're kind of new to guitar 
you can definitely grip onto that thing for dear life. I used to get some pains actually years ago. I think I was just I was holding everything too tight. You know? Not even realizing the tension, the extra yeah. tension in their joints yeah. and stuff. Yeah, not even yeah. realizing it. So it is to be expected, and you can have that. You have it dressed. You can have them refretted eventually. And if you really love a guitar, you can always have it refretted with stainless steel frets. And look at the modern deluxe because they have that Evo gold wire. A lot of companies are using stainless and Evo now, and I think that's the way forward myself. Um, I got some super chats here. Jasper sent the super chat. Thank you, Jasper. No question though. And then Patsy Smith sent one. No question, but just said thanks very much, Aaron and Spoon, for entertaining us with your answers to our questions tonight. So that's appreciated. Oh, nice to see your picture. That's cool. But then Lee has one. Look at that. Look at his picture. <laughs> so we bring Lee's uh, question to the top, and he says, question for Spoon, do you play a lot in Dad Gad? I play a few songs in Dad Dad. Now, with Lee, I never know if he's joking or not. <laughs> I don't think he is. Do you or Aaron play anything in that tuning? <laughs> no, I'll, I'll try it out. Maybe I tried it out long ago when I had one of those little books that showed you 8,000 guitar tunings. I probably dabbled in it. Um, I avoided Dad Gad for years because because it's it was the cool thing to do, and I was always allergic to that for a long time. And uh, so I played in Open D and Open G, and I played in Celtic C, which is similar to Dad Gad, except you're dropping the C G instead of uh, D A at the bottom. Things like that came up with songs there's several tunes there's set well some tunes on my some tunes on my album are in uh, dad gad there's one of them that is in uh dg i dropped the a down to a g so uh, but i've never done the double d like that that i know of i'll, I'll try that tonight thanks <laughs> lee i play in da -da 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 because everything's tuned to a D and you just put one finger on the neck and you just move it along like a slide guitar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not like that's uh, Keith Richards trick. No, no I, I have I have dabbled in it. I had I've owned I've 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 owned a couple of like um like like Variax guitar, self tuning guitars and dabbled in it. And before that I used to retune my acoustic to play some Joni Mitchell and I wrote some songs in that. I was quite into that years ago. But lately, I don't do any of that. The most I'll do now is tune the E down, simply because if you've only got one guitar at a gig, remember with me, like I was gigging in the city and it's so difficult to carry all the stuff there. So you've got one guitar and the mic stand and a bag of cables. So I don't want to be on stage and retuning it all. I also find that this isn't, this is a good shout out for like Rain Song. This doesn't happen with that guitar. When I, when I retune one string, I've got to then check the tuning on the others, or especially if there's two strings or more. It doesn't happen with the, with the carbon guitars, of course, but. So just for convenience, I kind of got away from it. I'd like to get back into it again. But I always think about Tommy Emmanuel. Someone asked Tommy Emmanuel this at his, at his um, Q&A a few years ago. And he said, the great answer, he said, um, no, nah, I'm, st I'm still learning to play in standard tuning, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kotke, Leo, Leo had said, uh, I did a uh, workshop with, with Kotke and Steve Warner and Ted Atkins years ago. And, and Leo was saying he regretted writing some of his early big numbers in stand and alternate tunings because he because of that very reason he said it's all right there on the fretboard and you hear that from the jazz people who won't even use a, even a capo because you don't, shouldn't that need to use a capo but no, I, there's I, no don't, way I, don't, that, I don't agree with that there's there's certain voicings you simply cannot do you can't yeah. have you can't yeah. have the exact same voicing and that's why uh, i mean lawrence never used a capo because he thinks he's losing too much tone with it mm. but but he does alternate tunings because and he, he regrets, he said, you know, when I made my dad gad book, I should have called it because you can't do that in standard tuning. And, uh, and particularly when he's doing his, uh, some marvelously elaborate arrangements from movie themes or whatever that's quite orchestral, um, he needs to be, to be able to have those harmonic uh, uh, relationships and stuff that mm -hmm. are, you can only get from playing a dad gad or Celtic C and stuff like that. But for me, there's some laziness involved. Like last week, I tuned the guitar down for a party, a half step, and I really liked the way it felt and sounded. I like that richer sound. But I tend to just leave it in standard tuning the whole time. I, I do like the sound of it. Like when you hear Dad Gad on a, on a piece of music, it just sounds incredible. I do like it. It's just that whole thing of having to retune the guitar to do it. Like if you have two guitars and leave one set up like that, that's, that could be a cool thing. What, what Lawrence usually does, he'll come out and he'll do probably four songs in dad gad 
and then he'll change to G minor mm-hmm. tuning, and they'll do two songs in that, and then he'll, and then he always ends by going into standard tuning. So he's doing, you know, two or four numbers, and then tuning and talking while he's tuning, and he's now got it down to the science, of course, and he just does it. Uh, that gig that I did it for for uh, Dick, I had two guitars. So I had mm-hmm. one a dad gave that I could switch to quickly to open. B yeah. and stuff like that, and the other one isn't standard tuning, and they allowed me to. And I had an AB switch, and they're both plugged in. And I just mm. hit the AB switch, and that was that. You know? Yeah, so yeah. It's just I think for me, it's like ten years of playing in the city, and I can't take two acoustics plus the other stuff. So I kind of, but I, I used to, I used to. Yeah, do I used to do. I used to do that. I would play my dreadnought for songs and play the other thing for my occasional, you know, instrumentals and the one tune of the, you know, I was doing an alternate tuning, but yeah, I got lazy too. So, one, mm. you know. yeah, but thanks for that comment um, question, Lee, because there's something I'd like to get back into, especially with the Joni Mitchell stuff. I, I play Bigelow Taxi in standard tuning, but I much prefer it in open tuning, definitely, or whatever, whatever she uses on that one. Um, and Rosin, thank you for the super sticker as well, but no questions. Okay, that's fine. You don't have to give a question. Um, let's come back up. We've got a few more minutes left, so let's see how many, more, how many more we can fit in. And then we've got to do the results of our poll to finish. Don't forget the poll. Don't, don't let me forget the poll. It's been running the whole time. <laughs> okay. Um, Colin says, we are 4-1 up. Oh, okay. He's talking about football. That's not related to football. <laughs> but thanks for the update. Up the hammers. Uh, Philip Watson got distracted. Did Spoon answer my question about adding custom rosette to an older guitar? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. You have the to go back and watch it again. Real quick, Phil, Philip. Yes, but you could probably get it done cheaper. Uh, rewatch the replay. I have a. I had a, a couple of recommendations for you. Oh, I like this one from Colin. Being a lefty, I can't see what I'm getting, <laughs> so I get nervy about the pick guard and the bear claw. Yes, see, finally someone agrees with me. Finally, someone gets it. I always, my eye, we were talking about looks earlier. My eyes always scan over for bear claw. My eye, my eye, is this weird, Spoon? I look at the pick guard pattern. Is that weird? Or does, is that just me that does that? Uh, no, it only happens to me if it really <laughs> stands out as being unusually odd and, and can I live with this? But that doesn't happen very often. Um, again, all of that stuff's trumped by the uh, tone as far as I'm concerned. Hmm. Um, bear claw. Nowadays, natural resources, etc., you would have never seen Bear Claw on a standard series guitar back before they called them the standard series. In the 80s, you're not going to, Fred Martin was way too conservative for that. You just wouldn't see it. And then when Bear Claw started getting cool with the, in the, in the Luthiers, you started seeing it on, you know, interesting Martins. And uh, nowadays, they just, uh, they're much more uh, worried about the integrity of the wood and, you, you, you know, even density and all that kind of well, stuff. Well, I can't, I yeah, I agree. You can't be wasteful. But that is that is just something that I've noticed that I do look at. Um, David, how you doing? Good to see David here. It says, why does my 0018V sound magical? Well, it's obviously because <laughs> it's, your, it's your technique and the way that you infuse your style into that unique uh, soundboard. That's clearly <laughs> what it's all about. Well, oh, hang on, I'm sipping up now. There's no cue there. Sorry, but good to see you here, David. Um, Ricardo, I like guitars with a lot of bass. I have an SJ200 and J45 Gibson and looking to get a Martin, probably a Rosewood Dreadnought. Any specific models with good bass response while strumming? Interesting. So you have a SJ200, which is maple, and you have J45, which is mahogany. And a lot of people think those woods aren't bassy, which isn't true. Mahogany, particularly bassy wood, it's just not as thick and round as rosewood. But if you want, if that's what you're all about and you want a dreadnought, then I have to say the HD35 has scalloped quarter inch bracing. So it's got a supercharged top dreadnought, Sitka, which is bassy. Um, I don't think it's as bassy as Adirondack, but you think it is because you get a fuller A and uh, D string too. It's not just how, how much, uh, how low the bass goes. And that, to me, is a, the lushest, uh, most Im, has the most impressive bass of of any Martin currently being made, as far as I'm concerned. So that would be my recommendation. Jim, thank you very much. Thanks, Aaron Short Music and Spoon Phillips for answering our questions. We like doing it. Always, I said, like, like I said, though, 
please um, help us with this. Share, share my channel. Go to the link I post in the chat for Spoon Phillips and make sure you subscribe to his channel and buy his album if you like what he does as well. And, and help us do more of these kind of videos. Especially we're talking about going out on location and doing some videos. So, you know, we'll, we'll put all your support into doing these things too. And I think we'll all benefit from it. It'll be a, f a fun thing to do. All right. So, I think we've got time for one more. Then we'll do the results of our poll. Unless we get any more super chats, this will be the last question. This is a good, great question. Actually, I've been meaning to make a video on this. Because I used to teach this to my students when I lived in London for the piano. And he says, do you have any hand stretching exercises? What do you do to prevent arm or shoulder injuries? Um, I do, and I've been doing them for many years, but I don't do them as often as I should. I would typically do them on my way to a gig and sitting on the subway and stuff. But um, stuff uh, that I learned from, from somebody who, I knew somebody who was going to Berkeley, uh, and uh, in Boston, and so he was showing me some of the stuff that he was being taught. And one of them is the, you know, this stretching the hand uh, with your other hand and mm -hmm. kind of stretching them and breathing and like breathing and relaxing, breathing, relaxing. And I do massaging. You want to, I dig in to the tent, the te all these tendons all anchor in here, and I'll find it. And you can find them by playing them and seeing where that's up. Oh, that's the one that goes, these two fingers go to the same tendon. And that's that tendon there, and I'll I'll dig in for to get the scar tissue going, and I'll and I'll massage it up, and I'll slowly move it up. I'm doing it much faster than I normally do, and I come in all the way, and I pull the tension out and throw it away, and I'll do that for all of the fingers after I've stretched them out, and I'll stretch them out again. You do these, but anytime you're doing your wrist, you want to be really light and really careful. None of this stuff's extreme. Um, you want to get into the joints. And a, a, a miracle chiropractor was telling me anytime you're doing joint adjustment, you take it you take it carefully to the extreme of the joint, and then you wiggle it around and it'll pop. And you go if the, if it needs to pop. So you're not doing anything violent. You take it to the extreme, and once you get it to the extreme, that's when you kind of wiggle it around. And I'll go through the joints that way. I'll get the same thing with my ancient thumb. This degeneration that's happening in here from old football injury. Um, but that's, I gave you a quick overview. That's typically what I do. Mm. So uh, I used to have one of those squeezers, you know, so you mm. can do that long ago when I was first really taking guitar seriously and when I got to New York City and, and in my early 30s. Um, and of course, if you've got anything really serious, make sure you get a professional to look at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, you definitely, yeah, um, absolutely. I'm, I'm no uh, osteopathic doctor, believe me. I, me I remember thinking back to I used to teach piano at a college in London and I used to do that with with the with the students I said like spread the fingers apart like this I think this is in like a John Petrucci guitar video or something and then pull them back again very gently while you're getting used to it like this each one and then go forward each one and actually if you're watching at home do this it's really interesting if you do those and then feel the difference between the two hands you can immediately feel this one is looser, the one you've worked on, than the other one. It's really and don't effective. And don't forget to breathe. Like and breathe in, yeah. you're stretching, you know, breathe through the stretch, that whole thing. Breathe yeah. that tension out of the area that you're trying to stretch and all that stuff. And you have to just, one thing that also helps is nobody likes to run scales. Even if you're not going to be a lead guitar player, but playing some basic stuff where you're stretching and making those stretches, it's all muscle memory, being able to make that, three or four fret stretch that you don't think you can make, you probably can if you do it enough and you practice it. And and that'll tell you very quickly where you're weak and where you what you need to, you know, stretch and what you need to focus on. Okay. My... Well, thank you, Spoon. To finish up, let's reveal the results of the poll. Can you remember what the question was? <laughs> it's like two hours well, ago. The question was the dreadnought size. Everybody knows the dreadnought size. Um, uh, it's people's perception that it's best for strumming, for flat picking, or for finger picking. Okay, I just ended it, so I was just going to see what the results are. I, lo I love this feature because it's anonymous. You can be completely honest. Like, we could we could play two guitars and say, which one do you prefer? And people can say it without any kind of recourse. So you, you can't see their name. It's really, really, really cool. So the results are in on my screen. I shall read them out. Do you associate the dreadnought body shape as best for strumming, flat picking, or finger picking? 54% said strumming, 28% said flat picking, and only 16% said finger picking. But like we said earlier, I've seen, that's 53 votes, that's great. 
But I've seen some fantastic fingerstyle players, a bit like, oh, what's his name? Um, the guy in Nashville, his father was really famous. He's oh, got you're talking about Tom, Tom Bresch. Tom Bresch plays it. He plays a dreadnought, right? Like with the with the yeah, big yeah, head. Yeah, and his dad played a D28, but he had a he had the neck replaced with a skinnier big, Bigsby uh, right. neck from electric right. guitar. Right. But yeah. right, right, right. So I, I, yeah, I get it. The smaller body, yeah, less bass, like you know, more Steve, comfortable. Steven, Steven Stills. There's definitely people who do it. Um, I think Redborn's played them for, you know, before. But um, Redburn. But I, uh, I love playing finger picking my dreadnought. I love the bigness of it. And there's certain tunes that I think just sound finger style tunes. But it's harder to play. It's harder to, you know, it's not, it's not the same experience. So I, it's easier to play my other guitars to do that kind of stuff. And before we say goodbye, I need to let everyone know. I should have said this. I should have said this earlier. We're doing this again on Labor Day, right? Isn't that two weeks' time? It's two weeks so, from today. There we go. Because we didn't answer all the questions, and so I've been and 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 your unofficial end of summer with us. Yes, and I I just started this new format, so I think it worked well. Let me know what you think. Um, I'll put my email address up one more time in case you want to send videos. Every week, it's like my last video to show. So I just need people to send me more pictures of their guitars, videos of them playing. Today's was great. Thanks to Johan for sending that in last minute for me. I love that. But just anything, even just want to like, um, just tell us about your guitar or something. It can be absolutely anything. But it's so nice to see the people that are watching on the screen and put a name, uh, face to the name. I really, and really everybody like can that. Everybody can reach out to me personally at any time with these kind of questions at yeah. one man yeah. at onemans.com. One yeah. man's with a Z. And put that in your in your calendars labor day two weeks time uh come back with those with any questions we didn't answer or any new questions you think up that you want to share and it's great here because we all get to um discuss it between us it's great so i think it worked great and thank you spoon i think we should go and feed our cats do you agree thank you thanks for having me and spoon's i'm link. gonna go feed myself so. Spo yeah me too spoon's link is has been in the chat the whole time definitely go and check out what he does and go and support him all right we'll see you in two weeks time look forward to it bye bye I'm not